Hello and thank you all for coming. Welcome to the first ever Trends in Psychology Summit hosted by the Harvard Women in Psychology Group. I'm Maheen Sher Mohammed. And I'm Haley Dorfman. And we're the presidents of the Women in Psychology Group, also known as WIP. Um, if you're not familiar with our organization, please check out our website and Twitter um, for news and statistics, Harvard WI Psych, um, news and statistics about diversity and inclusion in the psychological sciences, as well as upcoming events and more information about us. We're very excited to have in our program today speakers who represent a wide range of research areas and hail from a number of Boston area institutions. So each of our symposium today will begin with a talk from a featured speaker, followed by three uh, blitz-style talks from postdocs, research fellows, and graduate students. We'll have a coffee break after the second symposium, uh, right out here uh, to our right, your left, um, and uh, dinner and reception at the end of the event, which we hope you'll jo join us for. Um, we would like to extend a special thanks to all of the featured and flash talk speakers who will be sharing their work with us today. We have a lot to cover in a short amount of time, so we ask that you hold your questions until the end of each talk. And with that, we'll get started. So our first uh, speaker is Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. Dr. Barrett is a university distinguished professor of psychology at Northeastern University and director of the Interdisciplinary Effective Science Laboratory. Dr. Barrett's seminal work on emotion has transformed the fields of psychology and effective neuroscience. Her empirical and theoretical contributions have revolutionized how we define emotion and study its con constituent processes. One of Dr. Barrett's most inspiring strengths, however, is her commitment to open dialogue and debate with both scientists and the public. Her work has not only shifted the dominant paradigms in psychological science, but her scientific communication and outreach with the public have allowed her to link empirical science with society. We're so honored to have her speaking uh, today on the fundamentals of emotion, allostasis, interoception, and categorization within a predicting brain. So please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Thank you for that really lovely introduction and also uh, for uh, inviting me to talk with you today. Today what I'm gonna do is talk about one of my more provocative uh, ideas since this is a symposium on trends um, and also, I figured there'd be a lot of students and postdocs, and so particularly as a woman in science, I mean, it's hard to challenge the uh, general consensus in your field, no matter who you are. Um, but when you're a woman, it, it's particularly challenging. So I thought it'd be fun um, to talk about um, some of the work in our lab that I think is probably the most, maybe not contentious anymore, but, um, but provocative. Uh, and uh, although we're going to focus a lot today uh, in my talk on, on some neuroscience concepts, um, I, I think the most provocative aspects about this work is what it suggests for psychology and how we understand the human mind, actually. So rather, in the science of emotion, it is traditional to begin with common sense categories like anger, sadness, fear, disgust and then to go looking for the physical basis of those categories in the brain um, and in the body and, uh, and in the face and so on. My approach is a little bit different. I, um, when I retrained as a, a neuroscientist, um, I you know, was completely ignorant and came to the field knowing basically nothing. So I didn't have any preconceptions that I had to wrestle with and as a consequence, I think it allowed me to see some things that other people um, didn't necessarily see right away. And naively, I sort of thought that would be welcome, um, but it isn't. Sometimes it is. Eventually it is. You just have to have a certain degree of tenacity, I think. Um, and so that's what I'm going to start with. I'm going to start with some insights um, about the brain and then ask, well, what Given that we have a, a, this kind of a brain, what does that mean about the nature of emotion? And also. Is there anything that we can learn about actually how a brain creates a mind by using the science of emotion as a flashlight? So for me, this all begins, this journey, with the realization that a brain 
uh, has a problem, a reverse inference problem. Um, and what I mean by that is it's basically, for your entire life, your brain is entombed in a dark, silent box called your skull. Um, and it has to figure out what is going on in the outside world from sensory channel, the information that it gets through sensory channels in the body. Your brain is trying to figure out the causes of those sensations so that it knows how to act to keep you alive and well. And the problem is that the information is ambiguous and noisy. Sometimes it's incomplete. And any given sensory input, like a flash of light, can have multiple causes. So in addition to trying to figure out what sensations that come from the world mean, your brain is also trying to figure out what sensations from your body mean. Um, an ache in your gut could be hunger. That same ache could also be um, anxiety if you're in a doctor's office waiting for a test. Um, and if you're a judge in a courtroom, that ache could be a gut feeling telling you that the defendant is guilty. So how does the brain solve this reverse inference problem? How does it know the causes of sensory information when all it actually has access to are the effects? Well, it has one other source of information available to it. It has past experience. And so it, the, there's a, this idea which has been kicking around really uh, in psychology really since Helmholtz, I would say, but, um, uh, but more in a more modern sense, this is the idea um, that ideas that come from predictive coding, which is that what your brain is doing is it's remembering past experiences that are similar in some way to the present. And so what it's asking is not what are these sensations from the world, but what are they like? What are they like based on my past experience? So when your brain is um, trying, what your brain is doing basically, it's remembering a set of similar, it's, it's reconjuring or re-implementing a set of similar representations to what, what is going on currently. And in psychology, a group of things which are similar, we refer to that as a category, and the mental representation of a category is a concept. So here's the hypothesis that your brain is using past experience to create ab ad hoc concepts. <clears throat> These ad hoc concepts are basically predicting um, upcoming sensory information and motor changes. So they represent the possible causal relationships between events in the world and in the body um, as they are right now and what the sensory and motor consequences of those events will be in a moment from now. <clears throat> and I'm going to suggest to you today that this is not only how the brain makes emotion, this is actually the, the default process by which the brain navigates the world um, and constructs uh, your experiences and guides your action. So the idea is something like this, that the, at, a, you know, at any given point in time, your brain starts with initial conditions of the body and the world, and it predicts forward in time, uh, representing what's about to happen next, motor actions, um, visceral motor changes from the body, the autonomic nervous system, and other internal systems, um, and uh, as well as the sensory consequences of those motor changes by creating concepts that are candidate explanations, right? Candidate causal explanations for that, that input that's about to arrive, making it meaningful so that you know what to do next. When the inputs uh, from the world and the body, so the sensory inputs, confirm those predictions, meaning um, there's not too much deviation or difference, um, then you've categorized, your brain has categorized uh, those sensory inputs and acted accordingly. Alternatively, the hypothesis would be that uh, when um, the input from the world is somewhat unexpected, um, that is, whatever your, comes in through your sensory channels from the world and from your body is not what you expect, then you have something called prediction error. And this prediction error can be used to update uh, predictions uh, for the future, which in psychology we have a really fancy name for this. We call it learning. <laughs> so um, in a sense, your experiences and actions, including those that we think of as emotion, uh, 
are uh, what Gerald Edelman, the neuroscientist, referred to as the remembered present, right? A remembered present that is confirmed or modified by the sensory periphery. Um, and what I'd like to do is sort of show you a little bit uh, of what, uh, of how we've approached this question in my lab. I'm not going to get through all the data that I could show you, but so you think of this more like a tasting menu of ideas with a little bit of data um, to, uh, to, to keep you interested. So for us, uh, the working hypothesis of, uh, I would say, of how, how a brain implements these ideas really starts with anatomy. Um, and um, so if we think about, um, so I'm assuming most people here know what a brain looks like so that I don't need to orient you to the front and the back and so on, top and bottom. This is something I often do when I'm talking to the public. We have to build in extra time to like orient people to what they're looking at. Um, and here what I want you to pay attention to is the, the cortical sheet that surrounds um, uh, the rest of the brain, right? So if we were to take that cortical sheet off the rest of the brain, stretch it out in cross-section, and look at it, what you would see is that the neurons are arrayed in layers. And the, there is a, what is called a lamination gradient, or a, there are um, different parts of the cortex, uh, cortical sheet have different numbers of neurons in them. So some uh, parts have four layers, four or five layers. They're called agranular. It doesn't really matter. They're, I'm, doesn't really matter what the names are for this, for the present purposes, but I put them there just in case anybody cares. Um, I, um, then there are uh, those that have uh, like almost six layers or basically five layers with a rudimentary sixth layer and then um, six layers. So most of the time in textbooks and so on, we learn that the cortex has six layers of neurons, but that's actually not true. Um, and it turns out that there's about more than 30 years of research uh, showing that this lamination gradient in the brain, um, uh, that is the number of neurons that are stacked on top of each other, the number of layers they make, actually allows us to understand how information flows in the brain. Um, this is from track tracing studies, primarily in primates and um, other mammals. And the general uh, consensus is that when information makes its way from a less developed part of the cortex, so le less laminar development to more laminar development, that is a prediction signal, or uh, what is also called a forward signal, or is also called, confusingly, feedback. <laughs> <laughs> and when information goes in the other direction, um, it's prediction error. And so the question is, well, where are these parts of the brain that have these four or five or six layers? Well, the parts of the brain that have um, the most defined six layers are the primary sensory, uh, uh, primary sensory cord is these four distant senses like um, uh, audition and, um, and vision. And uh, because we evolved in the sea, it turns out, you know, somatosensory is also a distant sense if you're a fish. Uh, so, where are these regions? So here what I've done is I've taken uh, uh, basically a Broadman map and I've colored it in for you um, so to show you where um, the uh, different types of um, laminar uh, cortex can be found. And so the places that are colored in darkest gray and also the sort of medium gray turn out to be uh, the most powerful predicting parts of the brain. Does anyone know uh, what they're called? Just their conventional name? Anyone have an idea? They're called limbic. Limbic regions, uh, which uh, are colored here in um, dark gray and some in medium gray are actually the most powerful predicting regions of the brain. Here what I've done is I've uh, colored them for you in, um, in uh, more interesting colors. Um, and so what we're talking here about is the, the red and the dark orange regions. So there's an irony here, right? The irony is that for centuries, scientists have considered limbic regions to be the home of emotions. They're supposed to be, you know, the home of your inner beast, 
basically. They're highly, they're supposed to be highly reactive and in need of control by your prodigious, uh, you know, um, rest of your cortex. Um, but actually, uh, we know from a lot of different sources of evidence now that these regions are actually the source of prediction signals in the brain, and therefore they are driving uh, per perception and action in the brain, not just during emotion, um, but during all mental events. From the moment that you're born until the moment that you die, your brain is predicting sensory inputs uh, from the world and anticipating how to act on them, and those predictions begin uh, in limbic cortices. Now, what does this have to do with um, concepts? Well, if we were to look um, at uh, the um, upper layers of the cortex and we were to look at the neurons and their arrangement, what you would see is that at the front of the brain uh, where we find what are called association regions, like heteromodal, they're called association regions, so these are limbic regions but also uh, some other regions. Um, what we find are fewer uh, neurons, but bigger, and with many more connections. And at, um, in the primary sensory regions, like V1, uh, primary visual cortex, primary auditory cortex, and so on, what we find are much smaller neurons, more of them, and with fewer connections. And so what's really, one way to think about what's happening is that um, when information makes its way uh, from uh, limbic cortices to um, primary sensory uh, uh, regions, and, and to some extent motor, the motor strip too, although the motor strip, we can talk about that if there's time. Um, there's some interesting properties that separate it from sensory um, cortices. In any case, what's really happening is that there are these multimodal summaries, summaries of, um, of patterns of, of firing across all the modalities that basically cascade out to the primary sensory and motor regions becoming progressively more detailed, um, setting up the simulations that become the, the predictions for what's about to happen. And um, we can think about information in the other direction, that is prediction error coming in, the unanticipated information from the world and from the body going in the other direction. So that when you have information moving from a lot of little neurons, right, firing in synchrony, to being summarized with fewer and fewer and fewer neurons as you move to the front of the brain, essentially what you have is integration across sensory domains with progressive dimensionality reduction. So basically, new information is not learned kind of uh, in, a, um, you know, in a completely blank slate kind of way. It's being incorporated into uh, you know, representations that are already conceptual and, and, and active. In my lab, we were kind of curious to know, well, where are limbic regions arrayed? Like, where do you find them in the brain in terms of a, a network analysis? And so what we did is uh, we identified a collection of um, uh, basically regions in the cortex that are known to be agranular or have four layers, uh, and then um, examine what their connectivity is. And so we started with the primate brain, actually with a monkey brain, a macaque brain. We identified um, these regions and then made sure that uh, these regions were, were actually anatomically connected in, in a way that we expected them to uh, be, and we did. And then what we did is we used these as seeds in a um, intrinsic network analysis in humans. So essentially, what we did is we identified homologous regions in the brain, and then uh, we used brain imaging data, which was recorded from people while they were lying still in the scanner, being probed without, uh, where they were not being probed with a stimulus, so basically resting state um, uh, scans. And then we performed an intrinsic connectivity analysis for the voxels uh, in the red locations. And so on the left, we have the subgenual anterior cingulate, pregenual uh, anterior cingulate, mid-cingulate, which is basically um, where we placed the seed, was in the anterior mid-cingulate, which is also called the dorsal anterior <laughs> cingulate, um, and then uh, two seeds in the ventral anterior insula. And we examined uh, basically what were all of the other voxels in the brain whose bold signal fluctuated in sync with 
the neurons and um, with the neurons in the voxels that were um, in those red dots where we placed the seeds. And so we computed a set of summary maps. So we did this for approximately 300 subjects and then we replicated it for 300 with 300 subjects. And then what we did is we did a cluster analysis with these maps. And what we found was um, that the majority of limbic core disease are located in two networks that overlap in a set of hubs. And these are conventionally, these are known networks that um, there are hundreds and at this point maybe thousands of studies uh, which are in the literature um, uh, which have identified these networks. And so here I should point out the blobs that you're looking at are not activity, right? They're, con they're um, functional connectivity, that is regions that are fluctuating together when uh, a brain is at rest. And more or less this reflects uh, structural connections in the brain um, that we did verify with track tracing studies. What's interesting about this um, is that um, these networks have been implicated in basically every domain of psychological function that's ever been studied. Another thing which is interesting about this is that this little area that I've circled for you is considered to be primary interoceptive cortex. This is the primary sensory region for the internal sensations that come from your body, which are part of these networks, although rarely discussed. And what's interesting about that is that for the most part, we don't walk around being aware of every sensation that happens in our bodies. If we did, we'd never pay attention to anything outside in the world ever again, because there's a lot going on in there. Instead, uh, we tend to experience those sensations as affect, as feelings of pleasantness or unpleasantness, of feelings being worked up or being calm. And so this suggests uh, that these feelings of affect are not specific to emotion, but they may be with us at every waking moment of our lives um, as properties of consciousness. Now, I'm going to speed up a little bit uh, because I want to leave some time for questions. So here what I'm showing you now um, is um, the, uh, we've projected the connectivity into uh, the volume of the brain so that you can see that these two networks and their core and the core hubs where they overlap actually have extensive subcortical projections, far more extensive than anything t that anybody typically discusses in the literature. They're connected to the hypothalamus, to the periaqueductal gray, to the parabrachial nucleus, and a whole network of subcortical nuclei that control the body, that control your autonomic nervous system, your immune system, and your neuroendocrine system, among others. And so the, the hypothesis here is that whatever else these networks are doing, psychologically speaking, they are also regulating the systems of your body. And what do these networks do, psychologically speaking? As I said, just about everything. They've been implicated in just about every psychological phenomenon there is. And we don't usually think about the body, the regulation of the body, as being relevant for all domains of mental function. But these data, and others similar to them, suggest that the body is important. And so, for example, bringing subjects in when you don't, you know, for even if it's a study on working memory or a study on um, uh, attention, not knowing how much they slept, what they had to eat, how much caffeine they had, um, those kinds of questions uh, may actually be adding significant noise to your findings. And given the smaller samples that we have to deal with in psychology relative to maybe what we'd all like to do if we had more money um, and more time, uh, those uh, can, th this is a significant potential source of error that goes unmeasured that can wreak havoc with our effect sizes and therefore with replicability. And in fact, if you read the literature on brain architecture and the physiology of brain function, what you see um, are quotes like this. This is from a, a terrific book called The Principles of Neural Design. Um, uh, which opens, uh, the book opens with this quote, that the core task of all brains is to regulate the organism's internal milieu, that is the systems of the body, by anticipating the needs of the body and preparing to satisfy them uh, before they arise, so basically predictively. 
in psychology and uh, related fields, we call this anticipatory regulation of the body allostasis. So allostasis uh, is not just another fancy name for the idea of homeostasis, which has been around you know, for more than a century. It, it's substantially, it has a couple of differences, one of which is the predictive nature. Um, and of course, um, if it's really the case that the main job of the brain, or one of its main jobs, uh, is to regulate your body, um, then it's also continually representing the sensory consequences of the body, uh, which um, is uh, what we call interoception. So what this suggests is that, um, that predictions and uh, you know, if you'll just bear with me, the, the concepts that, that, that we can describe predictions as, as ad hoc concepts are, you can think of them as tools for establishing allostasis and regulating the energy needs of the body in addition to everything else that they do. So from a biological standpoint, it doesn't really make sense to divide emotion and cognition into separate faculties and suggest that, you know, the control of behavior is somehow uh, some kind of um, eternal battle between those two. That's a narrative that fits with our common sense kind of experience, but it doesn't actually fit with the structure of the brain. And I'm not suggesting to you here that the default mode and salience networks are specific for these biological functions. What I'm suggesting to you is that no matter what your brain is doing, seeing, hearing, thinking, daydreaming, it's also regulating your body. If you look in the brain, if you look in the, the literature on brain evolution, what, you'll, what you find is that brains didn't evolve uh, so that you could see and hear and think. They evolved uh, as bodies got more complex uh, in a predatory environment. I'll just give one example. I have many examples of this, but I'm just going to show you one. This is from, uh, this is research that's hot off the press from seven Tesla scanning that we're doing currently right now. Um, and um, this is an example of um, brain activity, so increases in bold activity uh, during uh, a cognitive control task. So we have subjects doing uh, an end back. They're doing three back versus a one back. And the th what I want to draw your attention to is the orange blobs, of, uh, which are um, an increase in activity. Um, including in this case, subjects are sitting lying still in a scanner performing an end back. This is just a straight cognitive task. Um, now, you can't see this activity with a standard three Tesla scan, but uh, the seven Tesla scans high is sort of very high resolution and, and allows us to see it. In addition, many of the other um, changes in activity um, uh, fall within, um, primarily within the salience network, although a little bit in frontoparietal control. And it turns out that um, we see something similar when we look at people, uh, for example, por performing a standard memory task, whether it's a recall task or a recognition task, with completely neutral material, just like paired associates. You also see these regions um, very, very active. Now, I'm, uh, I have a lot more to say about this. Uh, there's a lot more data that I can show you, and um, uh, there are other functions of these networks that have to do with the regulation of attention um, and um, actually controlling um, the synchrony in, in other parts uh, of the brain, particularly the sensory motor parts. Um, but I, what I'm going to do is just skip to the punchline. Um, so our working hypotheses are that predictions are concepts and that completed predictions are are, is basically ca categorization. So the brain is basically anticipating what's going to come next with what we would call a set of ad hoc concepts that it kind of makes on the fly. Um, and uh, when those concepts, when those predictions have been confirmed by the sensory environment, um, we can say that uh, that categorization has occurred, which guides action and constructs experience. And so when the predictions um, are um, emotion concepts, that is when the brain is using past experiences of emotion 
uh, is basically reinstating them for the purposes of anticipating uh, what might happen next, it can be said to be generating a concept, um, uh, which when it, um, sorry, which when it uh, uh, is confirmed um, is categorizing those sensations as an emotional event which guides action. Now, I had a bunch of data that I wanted to show you, um, but I'm going to stop really with this um, conclusion, which is that emotions from this perspective uh, are not, re they're not mere reactions to the world. They're actually your constructions of the world, or more precisely, they are your brain's understanding of what is happening inside your body and in the world. So they're basically categorizations of these sensory inputs for the purposes of guiding action. And in our lab, most of the work that we do, whether it's about emotion or brain function more generally, is really guided by, uh, by these ideas. And so um, I will stop now uh, with uh, thanking my fantastic lab, who actually has done all the really hard work for this couple of studies that I was able to show you, and for many more studies uh, that I have that I could talk to you about uh, which support these ideas. And so I'll thank you for your attention. So you're asking me uh, how people, how the brain deals with it create, constructing its own emotions versus perceiving someone else's emotions, and whether or not these are the same process or, or not? Well, what I would say is that, um, uh, that um, the hypothesis would be that, well, I have to, there, you know, in order to answer that question, there are probably a couple of preliminary things I have to say, and that is, um, if I were scanning your brain or if I was able to measure the neurons actually directly in your brain during an instance of, say, anger, and then I was able to do that again for some other instance of anger, the patterns would be different. So one of the things that we've learned is that there isn't a single brain state for anger. In fact, there are many brain states. In fact, you could say there's a whole population of brain states for anger just for you. And that's also true for every other person who uh, can uh, construct anger. So when you ask me, are the, are, you know, is the construction of uh, your own experience of an emotion the same as perceiving someone else, what I want to say is that, technically speaking, when you construct uh, at one instance of anger, uh, it, it may not predict anything about the, they may not have anything in common uh, on a neuro, at a neuron level, uh, or even at a voxel level, actually, with some other instance of anger that you experience. So if we're talking about general system level explanations, then yes. For example, the neurons that are considered to be motor neurons in premotor cortex, really what they are is creating, I would say, action concepts that are sensory motor, um, sort of integrated sensory motor representations, which are used for not just guiding your own actions, but also for perceiving the actions of other people, right? Um, so at a system level, I would say, yeah, they're probably, the, the mechanisms are similar, but if you're asking me whether exactly the same brain state would emerge, the answer is no, but it won't, e that will, that's also true for, you know, every instance of an emotion category that you can make that will be, di will be different from occasion to occasion. devising de novo uh, predictions and expectations based on the bodily state. And um, I, I didn't say de novo. I, I, I mean, I connectivity pattern that already drives sure. the pattern. Yeah. 
So this is a 20-minute talk, which actually went for 30 minutes, right? So there are many things that can't be discussed. And we can't discuss the architect, other parts of the architecture, which are important, like the cerebellum and the hippocampus and so on. We can't discuss um, the temporal trajectory. Um, we can't discuss development. How do these, you know, how do people, where does this information come from of these prior experiences? You know, I say, well, you know, the brain's using past experiences of emotion. Well, where the hell do those come from? I mean, there are a whole slew of things that we can't, uh, that we have no time to discuss. But um, I would say that uh, the, the brain is not um, one of the one of the things that we've done in psychology, and there are historical reasons for this, um, is we we study people in experiments where we have independent we randomize trials so that they're independent. So we have independent sequences of stimulus and response. Um, this has been true really since the early days of psychological. Uh, experimentation in the mid to late 1800s. And as a consequence, this has led, I think, um, this, and there are other reasons for this too, it's led scientists to believe that this is actually a model for how the brain works, that the brain is off and then we stimulate, you know, you stimulate it and then there's some kind of reaction, um, which of course is not really true at all. The, the predictions that are occurring are actually rooted in some temporal uh, dynamics, some temporal trajectory of what's just happened. So when we talk about context, modeling context, we think about, you know, if you're modeling the face, you think about, oh, well, I should measure the person's body and their voice. Maybe I might measure something about the external context. You know, so for example, if I were doing a study of um, uh, emotion perception, right, where uh, I would just measure your face and then I would compare it to my uh, judgment. But I, if I were really good, I might also measure your, what your body is doing, how it's moving, or maybe your voice. But I wouldn't necessarily ask, well, what configuration was your body and your face just in a moment ago? And I wouldn't also be measuring, as part of the context, my <laughs> physical state and what state my body was in a moment ago. All of those things are a form of context. So time, the way the brain deals with time, is largely not represented in how we do experiments. In fact, we try to get rid of, usually, in behavioral experiments, any kind of temporal dependency between trials. It makes it more difficult for us to analyze the data in the traditional ways that we do. Um, and so time is important. And from a predictive coding standpoint, it suggests that our primary kind of paradigm, empirical paradigm, this sequence of independent trials that we've randomized to be independent, is actually not very ecologically sound because we're throwing the brain into a situation where it doesn't predict very well. And that's not typical for how uh, your brain works uh, ecologically in an ecological setting for, for most of your life. Yeah. Thank yeah. You so much. Sure. This is mine too. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to um, set up here for our three flash talks. Um, and just for the uh, flash talk speakers, we do have a wonderful timekeeper over here who will be queuing you when you have two minutes left and then no minutes left. Um, so please keep your eye on her in the corner here. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here today. It's a real pleasure to be able to share some of my research with you. Uh, let's start this. All right, so my name is Lara Vujovic, and the um, topic today is regulating emotions by using situation selection. So situation selection is one of the many emotion regulation strategies we can use to change how we feel. It's defined as selecting a situation based on its presumed emotional potential. And I'm sure that many of you in this room have already used it at least once today. For example, um, we approach some situations or enter some situations perhaps enthusiastically, like maybe going to the symposium today, hopefully. 
Other times we avoid uh, situations altogether, and maybe, maybe for you this time it's like writing a grant uh, application, and I'm not trying to remind you of that. Uh, so I, I've wondered for the past few years at Tufts, uh, how do we do this and why? And you may ask yourself, well, why did you care in the first place? And it's because situation selection has consequences for our well-being. So when we're stressed out or upset, we prioritize the short-term emotional goal of feeling better over some other goals. For example, sometimes when I feel stressed out, I would rather go for this part of the bowl. And I'm sure, or I hope, <laughs> a lot of you can relate to that. Um, but if I indulge in these kind of experiences too frequently, that can have negative consequences for my health. So it, that's why it's important for us to understand the mechanism behind situation selection. Now, what we know about it so far is that people report using it to change their emotions in their daily life. We also know that people choose situations, at least in part, based on the affect of those situations. And there have been four different patterns identified so far in the research that's mostly come out in the last few years, actually. So pe we identified a hedonic preference where people prefer positive over neutral and negative experiences, so like some nice wine and food. Um, Contrahedonic preference where some lab studies show the preference for negative stimuli over positive and neutral. And some other studies show the preference for emotional, whether positive or negative over neutral, or just preference for neutral over emotional, like over any kind of emotion. So the question for us here is whether there is a, a unifying effective pattern for choosing situations. So are these all these four, do they happen based on some individual differences, group differences, situational differences? Why do we see all of this change? So I'm not going to necessarily go into all of them because that's a lot, but I can tell you, I will tell you about the one with that we potentially identified. And then the second thing we don't really know, we have a lot of um, data from the lab, but we don't really know a lot about how people use situation selection in their everyday life. So we set out on this journey to uncover some of these questions, and this is something that I spent a lot of time doing in grad school uh, over the past few years. And then, oh, um, I hope this is on my, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and then, because uh, I was surprised that this happened so quick. And then, uh, the beginning uh, of this year, we had this paper out in scientific reports and we pre-registered it on the OSF platform, uh, which dealt about situation selection and uh, dealt with situation selection and failure. For the purpose of this talk, I'm not going to talk about failure of emotion regulation, but I will talk about what we found out about situation selection. So we had 90 people complete the task online on Amazon Mechanical Turk, and uh, here's what they saw. They either saw positive stimuli, uh, neutral or negative for 500 milliseconds. And then after each picture, we asked them, do you want to see this picture again? If they said yes, most of the time we would show it to them. I'm saying most because in the failure condition we didn't, but I'm not going into that. And then if they said no, most of the time they would just look at the blank screen for another six to eight seconds until the next trial. So what we found is pretty strong hedonic pattern. So you can see on the y-axis here, it's we calculated odds ratios of saying yes compared to saying no to a picture, and these are much higher for positive compared to neutral situations, and even more so for neutral compared to negative situations. So then we were wondering, we identified this hedonic pattern, whether this could be shifted by uh, something else. And we thought maybe we could look into mindfulness which we chose this definition to guide us, that mindfulness is the awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. And we didn't just get this out of nowhere. There is some work that made us suspect that mindfulness could play a role. Um, most of that work comes from the literature on experiential avoidance, which involves an individual who is not willing to remain in contact with certain private experiences. So when experiential avoidance has a goal of changing emotions, then it could be one facet of situation selection, the facet of avoiding negative situations. So we thought it was worth looking into this. Uh, research identified a decrease in experiential avoidance after completing mindfulness-based therapy, so people are less likely to avoid stuff after that. 
after, even after a brief in-lab mindfulness induction, and they noticed the link between self-reported trait mindfulness and the decrease or less experiential avoidance. So for practical purposes, we sort of wanted to look in, uh, into these two more in depth. So we devised two studies, and we actually finished data collection a few weeks ago, so this is all super fresh and new. Um, and here's the task for the first study. We had 132 people come to the lab. We show them the same situation selection task, just without the whole failure manipulation. And then after, the, after they completed that task, we, they listened to a 15-minute audio recording. One audio rec for one group, it was a focused breathing um, recording, which we used as a proxy for mindfulness. And for another group, it was a mind-wandering um, audio, which was basically telling them to just let their mind wander. After that, we had them complete a state mindfulness questionnaire that served as a manipulation check. And then they did the situation selection task again, just with a different set of stimuli, although comparable in affect. What we found is the same or very similar um, hedonic pattern we identified in our first study. So here you can look at the odds ratio. So odds of selecting the positive, uh, of saying yes to seeing a picture are much higher if the picture is positive compared if the picture is neutral or negative. However, we did not find that our brief mindfulness um, induction made a difference here. And we think one of the reasons could be because the state mindfulness questionnaires that people filled out didn't really differ between the two groups. So the means were very similar. This indicates that it's potentially our manipulation that didn't work in this case. So we wanted to see whether we can identify a relationship between situation selection and mindfulness in everyday life. Um, we had 139 people complete the study on uh, Turk Prime over the course of four days. On day zero and day three, so the last day, we had them fill out the mindfulness measure, FFMQ, and then we got the average of those, those two scores to be our trait mindfulness measure. And then we adjusted the day reconstruction method by Kahneman, and we had them complete that on day one, two, and three. And that's how, this is how it looked. So on the, we asked them to recall morning, afternoon and evening episodes, they could recall up to 10 epi episodes each. And this was our measure of situation selection because for each episode oops, that they uh, recalled, we asked them a bunch of these uh, follow-up questions. So we asked, did you choose to be in the situation because you thought it would be unpleasant or you thought it would be uh, pleasant or you chose it because you wanted to avoid being in another pleasant situation or in another unpleasant situation? Our hypothesis uh, focused on the first and the last one. We thought that different mindfulness scores may make people um, behave differently in terms of approaching pleasant and avoiding unpleasant. And that's what we found. So if you look at this first graph here on the x-axis, it's a centered mindfulness score, and on the y-axis, it's the uh, like or odds ratio of avoiding negative situations. And you can see that the higher this mindfulness score is the less likely people are to report that uh, they avoided negative situations. And for positive, it was uh, the opposite. So the higher the mindfulness score was, the more likely people were, or the odds are actually higher of people approaching positive situations. So what I want you to take from this talk today is that uh, we believe that people have a hedonic preference for selecting situations. And we also uh, seem to identify a relationship between self-reported trait mindfulness and situation selection. However, our in-lab manipulation didn't show that result. So I think maybe a logical next step would be to study the impact of a longer or more long-term mindfulness practice on people's daily choice of situations or people's in-lab behavior. But I think the 15-minute focused breathing um, exercise we used perhaps wasn't enough to induce mindfulness in people, in this context at least. And then lastly, I think it's worthwhile examining the link between situation selection and some other individual and group characteristics. We examined mindfulness, but there is a lot more that literature suggests could be interesting, and some of our pre previous preliminary data uh, suggest the same. So with this, I would like to conclude. I would like to thank you for your time, and I would especially like to thank my advisor, Heather Uri, for her support and help over the years, and I would love to thank my um, lab mates, Victoria, Gizem, and Jen, everyone in the Emotion, Brain, and Behavior Lab, research assistants who really collected most of this data and processed most of it, um, psychology department at Tufts, and the funding that made this work possible.
Thanks. Uh, one of some of our previous studies that actually arousal does matter, but we so I avoided calling this valence specifically. I kind of give it this affect category because we never really separated uh, arousal and valence in our work explicitly. Yeah, maybe I can think of calling that pattern differently too because I can't really say that we studied the impact of valence and arousal separately, but I do think. Uh, it's it would be worth looking into that. Thank you. Okay, we're just gonna move right along. Okay, um, thanks for having me, um, and thanks for all the organizers. So my name is Yan Wu from MIT. And today, I'm going to talk about children's ability to understand the causes of others' emotional expressions. And, and first of all, let me give you a few examples. This is a picture of a group of people. We know nothing about them, and we know nothing about this event. But because everyone is expressing an emotional expression, we can make lots of good guesses about them. For example, what are they looking at? Football game or sports game, say. <laughs> and what about this? Great, good job. <laughs> what about this? Scary movie, great. And if you think that these are just special example Google images, I, I also have some real life photos from our lab. So this is a photo of my advisor's daughter and her friend when they were watching Harry Potter. It's about the moment when the chamber of secrets is open and a giant snaky thing comes out. <laughs> um, so broadly, my research program looks at how we use emotional expressions as information to recover unknown information about the world, including external events, internal mental states, and the broader social context. And this work is different from a lot of previous studies about emotion. There has been a huge literature looking at what emotion is, like um, uh, the nature of emotions and how it is generated. And there is also a huge literature looking at how we infer and predict emotions from their mental states or past history. And my work is different from both of this. I take a cognitive approach to study our common sense knowledge of emotion. And I'm particularly interested in an inverse inference problem. Given emotional cues, can we recover the causes of them? And we think that this inverse inference problem is important because in the real life, we don't usually know why other people feel that way, but we often get to see the emotional expressions on their faces or in their body language. And I look at these abilities mostly in infants and children because I'm interested in the most fundamental representations that emerge early in development. And just to give you a flavor of my previous work, I've found that preschoolers can recover someone's false beliefs given a change of valence before and after she knows an event outcome. And I've also developed computational models um, to capture how we might use emotional expressions in diverse contexts and situations to aim for beliefs and desires. And I also found that children can use someone's emotional expression to infer the broader social context based on their knowledge of social display rules. And for today, I'm going to focus on one of my studies, looking at young children's ability to match emotional expressions with their eliciting events. And the idea was inspired by our intuition that there are 
um, many external events are reliable predictors of our particular emotional responses. For example, spoiled food usually generates disgust, and rope hanging bridge usually generates fear, and fireworks generate excitement, breathtaking landscapes generate awe, and cute babies generate affection. And it's possible that even young children can represent these probable causal relationships. And another aspect of this representation is that it might be relatively fine-grained. We can distinguish between disgust and fear, and here between excitement, awe, and affection. And consistent with this, there are lots of emotion words in each valence domain. And to the degree that we distinguish these emotions, we distinguish not only these emotion words, but can also represent the probable context and causes that elicit these emotions, and also the probable emotional expressions and vocalizations that accompany them. So in our study, we asked infants and children to match emotional expressions to simple external events. And to look at the fine grained aspect of this understanding, our emotional expressions in our study were positive. So in total, we selected a range of eliciting causes that we thought would generate distinct but all positive emotional reactions. Um, and we presented these pictures to human adults in a random order and recorded their nonverbal emotional vocalizations. And we also included crying babies here because uh, we thought that it, this might be particularly interesting because although the babies are crying, um, these are negative, adults will usually express a warm, comforting, and soothing emotional response. And this response is very similar to, but with some subtle differences from their emotional response to adorable babies. So overall, we had both agents and objects as causes for generality, and we also included some close contrast for specificity. And to give you a sense of how um, they sound like. <laughs> Ooh. Aww. Aww. Mmm. Okay. So um, we want to know whether children can match these emotional vocalizations to their causes. In, in total, we had five experiments. And the youngest children we tested were 12 months old. And we used a range of methods to find convergent results. And to give you a sense of the procedure, on each trial, we randomly selected two pictures from two different categories and played the two corresponding vocalizations alternatively. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. And children just needed to sit there and watch. And we found that children as young as 18 to 23 months old, they shifted their looking to the matched picture when they heard an emotional vocalization. And when we used a simplified design, playing only one vocalization repeatedly <laughs> um, on each trial, <laughs> even 12 to 17 months old succeeded. But what are children actually doing here? One possibility is that maybe it's just simple association children learn through observation. Or there may be a role of first person emotional responses. Children may have generated their own emotional responses to the stimuli, and they prefer to look at a picture that would generate congruent responses with what they heard. Or they may have a more abstract representation they may understand that a particular kind of causes connects to a particular kind of responses. And we think that all those accounts may not be mutually exclusive, but here we specifically wanted to know whether by the second year of life, um, their representation has already been relatively abstract. And to test this, um, we look at the youngest age range we tested so far and used a menu search task. So during the study, the experimenter looked into a box and made a vocalization, like, aw. And the experimenter handed the box to a baby. Oh. And imagine that you were the baby, you search the box, and you find an orange inside. What do you think, and what are you going to do? And by contrast, if you heard aw, and you found a puppy, what do you think, and what are you going to do? And the predictions were that 
If a baby finds an orange, which is incongruent with the vocalization, they may think that there's something else in the box, they may go back to the box and continue to search. But if they find a puppy inside, they are less likely to do so. And similarly, if the experimenter said, hmm, then the orange is the congruent cause and the puppy is the incongruent one. But overall, we expect them to search longer in the incongruent conditions than the congruent conditions. And what's interesting here is that for the incongruent conditions, children never saw the real cause of the vocalization. So if they succeed on a task, this cannot be simply explained by um, direct as association or first person emotional responses to the objects. But it suggests instead that they may have a more abstract representation. And when the apparent cause is incongruent with the vocalization, they aim for something else. And using this design, we tested two emotion contrasts, R oh versus mm in one experiment, and R oh versus wow in the other. And in both experiments, 12 to 17 months old searched longer in the incongruent condition than the congruent condition. Okay, so across five experiments, we found an early emerging ability to distinguish nuanced within valence and emotional expressions. And those children not only associate those emotional expressions with their probable causes, but they also searched for hidden causes when the apparent cause was improbable. And the final point is that when we label our emotional expressions to the stimuli, we may say amused when we see silly faces, we may say excited when we see cool toys, but what's interesting here is that um, there's no simple English emotion word that captures our feelings when we see a cute baby, a crying baby, or delicious food. And although we often have strong emotional responses to this, and we do have a large number of emotion labels in English, even these labels cannot easily capture our emotional responses to some of the most common things in our life, such as babies and food. And we think that this may speak to the fact that we may be able to experience and understand more than any given language can say. But our study suggests that at least some of the subtleties and the richness can be captured non-verbally and are accessible to even infants. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Hi again, it's me. Um, <laughs> this time talking to you about research and not boring things like timing and coffee breaks. Um, <laughs> so uh, when we go about the world performing actions and getting feedback, uh, it turns out that not all outcomes are created equal. And what I mean by that is that prior evidence shows that we learn differently from positive and negative outcomes depending on the context. But what aspect of context leads to these biases? The work I'm going to present to you today suggests that beliefs about control influence to what extent people learn from different outcomes. As an example, let's say we take an action that many of us are familiar with, submitting a paper to a journal. Next, we receive feedback, which in this case might be a negative review. And we then have to make an agency judgment and decide whether the feedback is our fault, maybe because we're a poor writer, or the fault of someone or something else, like a really mean reviewer. <laughs> Similarly, we might instead receive positive feedback, and we then have to determine again whether the favorable outcome was because we're incredibly smart or whether we should attribute it to an incompetent reviewer. <laughs> What we're interested in is the idea that internal attributions will cause you to update your behavior, whether that's rewriting a manuscript or persisting in a rewarding action. And external attributions allow us to explain away the feedback and attribute it to a hidden or an uncertain cause. In other words, how we make these determinations about control plays a large role in how, when, and if we use information to update our future behavior. With that in mind, the goals of the study that I'm going to show you today were to determine whether beliefs about control can influence learning from positive and negative feedback and to what extent, and importantly, to determine the computational processes that lead to these biases. 
To address these questions, we first manipulated the causal structure of a reinforcement learning task to induce both positively and negatively biased learning in the same participants. Participants are told they're going to be mining for gold in the Wild West, and on each trial, they choose between two different mines. Um, on each choice, they either receive gold and get a small amount of bonus money, or rocks and they lose a small amount of money. One of the mines rewards gold 70% of the time and the other 30% of the time, and they have to learn over the course of the task which mine is going to reward them more often. To manipulate participants' beliefs about control, we had them complete multiple trials in each of three conditions or territories. In bandit territory, you sometimes get rocks regardless of which mine you choose. In tycoon territory, you sometimes get gold regardless of which mine you choose. And in sheriff territory, you sometimes get either rocks or gold at random. And participants don't know on which trials the bandit, tycoon, or sheriff has intervened. But after they get feedback, we ask them whether or not they believe that the relevant character caused a particular outcome. So if causal inference about feedback doesn't influence learning, then participants in our task should learn similarly from good and bad outcomes. Let me quickly illustrate what that might look like. So essentially, it's not going to matter which territory you're in. You would learn equally well from positive and negative feedback throughout the entire task. But if people are making causal attributions about different types of feedback, then we should see asymmetrical learning. So in our task, you should learn more from positive compared to negative outcomes when you're in the bandit or adversarial condition, because you can explain away rocks as being the bandit's fault. But you can be certain that when you get gold, it was a result of your own choices. Similarly, you should learn more from negative outcomes in the tycoon or benevolent condition, because in this instance, the tycoon might be giving you gold but can't give you rocks. And lastly, you should learn equally well in the sheriff condition, because the sheriff may be intervening to give you both gold and rocks at random. The um, key thing here to keep in mind, uh, the key prediction here, is the interaction between the differently valenced feedback in the bandit and tycoon territories. And you can think of the sheriff condition as sort of a control condition. Any asymmetry that we see in this condition, we can interpret as a rough proxy for a biased prior. In other words, some participants will likely come into the task with preferences for either good or bad feedback. What the sheriff condition is gonna allow us to do is subtract out a baseline individual difference bias from our other two conditions so that we can view whether our hypothesized interaction exists as a direct result of our experimental manipulation. If there's no bias in the random condition, then the ideal interaction would look something like this. So to explicitly hypothesize this learning process, we generated a computational model. Our model is a Bayesian model that can be expressed as a reinforcement learning model with a causal inference component. I'm gonna walk you through it in a very simple way, so no math today. We can begin with a reinforcement learning update rule where the participant updates their value estimate of a mine based on the feedback that they receive by taking their previous value estimate and adding that to a learning rate, which represents how quickly that they learn. And this is then multiplied by a prediction error, which is the actual feedback minus their estimated feedback. And so, so far we have sort of a standard update rule. We then scale our learning rate depending on how much the participant believes they have um, uh, how much control the participant believes they have given the feedback that they've received. And this belief is gonna accumulate over all past trials. Intuitively, all you need to worry about is that when the posterior probability of belief in uh, the latent agent is high, so in other words, if you believe someone else caused an outcome, then your learning rate is gonna be low and vice versa. Um, so we collected a data uh, from 72 participants on MTurk, and I won't show this data here today, but we have replicated this now in a total of three independent samples. Um, and we first fit a simpler model with separate learning rates for each territory and type of feedback in order to not constrain any existing participant bias. In other words, this model that I'm showing you here ignores the task's agency manipulation. You'll notice when looking at the subject data on the right um, that there's an overall bias where people are learning less from negative feedback relative to positive feedback. I'll get to why I think this might be in a little bit, but what should be obvious is that this bias is not predicted by our rational model um, shown here on the, in gray. We can also plot what learning rates um, 
what the learning rates derived from this model look like if we remove any of that bias the participants are coming into the task with by subtracting out that random condition from the other two conditions. And when we do control for that bias by removing the random condition, um, we see our expected interaction. While it's significant, the effects are very small and noisy for this particular model. However, if we plot the same exact thing for our, hyp our hypothesized Bayesian model, which can account for causal inference, we do see our much cleaner interaction. This model allows us to dispense with multiple learning rates as well, and as a result, it's going to fit our data much better. Um, just as another proof of concept, I want to show you that overall people do learn more from trials where they believe that the outcome was a result of the latent agent intervention, so by that tycoon, bandit, or sheriff. Um, and next, I wanted to see if we could explain why people seem to learn more from positive feedback. So we turn to their self-reported beliefs about agency. Here the y-axis is how strongly people believed that the bandit tycoon or sheriff caused an outcome split by condition and feedback. And you'll notice that overall people believe that negative outcomes are more often the fault of someone else. So these results together with our other results that I just showed you on the learning rates um, suggest that people might be exhibiting a sort of self-serving bias where they're more likely to attribute good things to themselves and bad things to other people. And just to show you really quickly that we don't actually even need participants' self-reported beliefs um, because our model can predict their beliefs about agency on its own. So on the top is data from the fitted model and the bottom are subjects' self-reported responses. And on the right is a Fisher transformed correlation between the model's intervention probability um, and the subject's actual uh, reported beliefs about the intervention probability. So just to conclude, what I've shown you today is that we can shift relative learning uh, for positive and negative outcomes in the same participants simply by manipulating their beliefs about control. And that a novel um, Bayesian model that accounts for causal inference provides a good account of task behavior. Um, and by exploring these data, however, by using a less constrained model, while it doesn't fit as well, we can at least see um, that there's a bias to learn less from negative outcomes, which might represent this sort of self-serving bias. I'm going to skip this because we are low on time. So with that, I just want to thank my advisors, Sam Gershman, and my collaborators, Rahul Bowie and Brent Hughes, and all of you for listening. Thanks. And I'm also going to martyr myself, so no questions, <laughs> but um, because we are, we are running a little bit behind, and so we'll move on to our next symposium. Um, and after that symposium, we'll have a coffee break. Um, but I love to talk about this stuff, so feel free to catch me at the coffee break if you have any questions. Um, and so Arunima is going to come up and introduce our uh, next symposium speaker. We're going to get started with the next set of talks. Um, my name is Aruna Masarin. I am a member of the TIPS organizing committee, and I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, Professor Helen Tager Flossberg. Dr. Tager Flossberg is a professor of psychological and brain sciences at Boston University, as well as the director of the Center for Autism Research Excellence. For decades, Dr. Tager Flossberg's research has helped expand our understanding of the communication, language, and social cognition impairments associated with neurodevelopmental disorders, including autism spectrum disorder. Her multidisciplinary work has sought not only to explain variation in the etiology and expression of the communicative symptoms of ASD, but also to develop and test interventions that may best serve individuals seeking treatment for symptoms of autism and related disorders. Through her academic work and through her roles, as a columnist for the online magazine Spectrum, a member of the editorial boards of multiple journals and books, and the former leader of the International Society for Autism Research, Dr. Tega Flissberg has dedicated her career to discovering and advocating for more nuanced and more accurate views of the factors and systems that contribute to the complexity of neurodevelopmental disorders. It is my honor to introduce her talk today on predicting autism in the first year of life. Please join me in welcoming Professor Helen Tager Flissberg.
or I was a student in experimental psychology, uh, thinking that I could just barge in and, uh, and make my way uh, with this particular population. Um, but I've stuck with it, and I have to say it's uh, really been very rewarding. At the time when I began, um, we diagnosed autism. We didn't have a formal criteria almost. Um, whatever there was in the DSM um, at the time were very vague. There were no instruments. We just went out and used a checklist. But the truth was it was very easy to distinguish between autism and non-autism because all the kids that we saw um, were fairly extreme. They had not been diagnosed until they were uh, four, five, or six years old. That was the standard at the time and still is true in many parts of the world and in some regions in the United States. Well, we now have DSM-5, okay, and autism is much uh, more cleanly diagnosed. There's two domains of impairment, behavioral impairment, impairments in social communication, and the presence of repetitive behaviors, restricted interests, or responses to sensory stimuli. Importantly, what we know is that these symptoms do emerge in the second year of life, okay? And here are some data that came from uh, Sally Ozanoff illustrating this. Um, and what you can see, this is eye changes developmentally in eye gaze, in social smiles, and in vocalization. Infants who were diagnosed at the age of 36 months, we see at six months there's no differences between the groups. And we see changes over time and the significant differences between the groups, these are low risk controls, emerges sometime after 12 months. Okay, so the talk that I want to uh, present today is a slice of a uh, much larger project, not just that I'm working on, but many groups um, around the country and, and the world on predicting um, autism. And the question is, can we identify risk or even predictive factors before the onset of those behavioral symptoms? Okay, and to do so, we do, and I gave you a preview of that, we do longitudinal studies. We start out with infants as close to birth as we can, um, and we study what we call high-risk infants. Um, almost always these are um, uh, infants who have an older sibling that's already been diagnosed with autism, and we start out with them early, and we follow them out through the age of uh, 36 months, ideally, at which point we can uh, really confirm whether they do or do not have autism. And the work that I've been doing in this area for the last uh, 12 years or so is a collaboration with uh, Professor Charles Chuck Nelson um, here at Harvard, okay? That's him. Uh, and what we're doing is investigating uh, neural activity using um, two different uh, technologies. We use primarily electrophysiology, both EEG and ERP, and functional near-infrared spectroscopy. Um, and our goal is really to identify differences both in brain function, which is what these technologies uh, tap into, or if we want early biomarkers that would predict uh, later outcome and also developmental uh, change over time. And we use these technologies because they are much more feasible to implement with infants. There is one infant SIB study, as it's, as it's called, um, the IBIS study led by Joe Piven, and it's a multi-site study, and they are using uh, MRI uh, and fMRI and DTI, um, but uh, we've chosen a different approach here. Okay, why do we study siblings? Well, that's because what we know is that they have a far increased probability of getting, uh, of later being diagnosed with autism. And this is data based on over 2,500 infants from the Baby Sibling Research Consortium. And you see there's an overall rate of about one in five 
if you have an older sibling. It's different if you're male, and it's different if you have more than one older sibling, but that's the average overall. So in our study, and this is actually data from what we now call ISP-1, because we now are studying a whole new cohort, but this is our original cohort um, that we studied from three to 36 months, and HRA stands for high risk for autism. Uh, LRC are the low risk controls or comparison group. HRL are high risk for language. We felt it was very important to compare not just infants who are at risk for one neurodevelopmental disorder, but we wanted to have a second neurodevelopmental disorder. And the answer is we were pitiful in our recruitment possibilities, and that's a uh, something else we can discover. And none of those infants who had an older sibling with SLI turned up with anything. So uh, we dumped them uh, from, <laughs> from further consideration. Um, okay, um, so we see them at multiple time points, which I <coughs> highlighted on the previous slide, and we do tons of stuff with them when they come to the lab. In red is what I'll be talking about today, behavioral measures, eye tracking, EEG, ERP. Um, we added the genetics and FNIRs later with an additional grant funding. Um, and we also do home diaries and video that we have analyzed as well, and I won't be talking about that today. Okay, so let me start by talking about the ERP paradigm that we used to tap into early uh, language development. And it's a very uh, standard uh, speech perception. Okay, in the first year of life, we administered this at three, six, nine, and 12 months, and we're looking at the phenomena of perceptual narrowing, whereby they, the infant hears lots and lots of the standard da. Uh, about 10% of the time, they hear ta, and about 10% of the time, they hear this Hindi da. Okay, and the I'm not going to go into this because it's not really relevant for the data that I'm going to show you uh, now. Um, but uh, this was the paradigm that we used, and we're able then to extract different measures uh, that tell us something. What can we use here that predicts later outcomes? So uh, one of the more re recent um, analyses uh, that April Levin, one of our collaborators, um, did was to look at the three-month infants who later were, um, these are the infants later diagnosed with autism, the high-risk infants who didn't end up with autism, and the low-risk controls. And we have here a measure of intertrial phase coherence. It's how variable is their response, their neural response, okay, um, and here we're looking at the P, the amplitude of the P150. So, it, but it's a it's a variability in that amplitude, um, and uh, at three months, and the P150 is the um, ERP that's maximally responsive to the sound. And we looked here just to the standard DA, which is repeated over time. And basically what we found, uh, lower means uh, higher variability, that we had the greatest variability um, in the ASD infants. But as you can see, sensitivity and specificity would not exactly do well here. But there's clues that even at three months, there's something different in how their brains are responding to a specific, uh, very common auditory stimulus that the infants are being exposed to. We then also looked at the late slow wave at six, nine, and 12 months. And this is a measure of a lateralized response. If you see a difference um, in the uh, late slow wave um, in the two hemispheres, that suggests that there's some emerging lateralization of response to this speech sound. This was uh, work that was begun by uh, my former doctoral student, Annie Seary. And what you see here is the blue are the low risk control, uh, the red are the high risk, um, and means that they didn't have autism as an outcome, so that's interesting. Whatever we see here has nothing much to do with autism, but it's to show you that this is a rather complicated group of babies. And at six months, we don't see any difference in the left and right hemisphere response. 
By nine months, we see it emerge in the late slow wave, in the low risk infants, and maintained at 12 months, and we don't see it at all in the high risk infants. My current doctoral student, uh, Kayla uh, Finch, uh, extended this analysis. We now had more infants, and we were able to look at infants who had um, autism as an outcome. And what we found was, and this is what the summary waves, and this is the, uh, the summary, is that in fact, these are the high risk uh, without autism. And what we see is that in the infants, and this is 12 month data, who later were diagnosed with autism, we're seeing, if anything, a reversed laterality. So the brain seems to be functionally organized for speech perception in a distinctive way. But again, there's some overlap in the groups um, that uh, is important to keep in mind. And then two uh, postdocs, uh, Julia Rigi and Adrian Tierney, looked at functional connectivity in this uh, speech network. Basically, what they looked at, our measure of functional connectivity, was the event related in the gamma band, looking at uh, coherence in response between the frontal and parietal in both left and right hemisphere to the uh, P1, uh, uh, to the speech stimuli. And again, what we found was highest connectivity at 12 months in the low risk controls and lowest in the high risk with a, who came up with autism. But this group also seems is, is somewhat intermediate. And this is a very um, strong pattern that we see. And this is all, of course, now 12-month data in both lateralization as well as uh, functional connectivity. Using our f -NIRS data, uh, we're able to go uh, somewhat younger in looking at functional connectivity. Um, and here what we did was we used a standard paradigm. This is what our uh, NEARS uh, uh, pro probe set looked like. Um, and uh, the babies, again, they're sitting there passively, and they either hear um, ABC, you know, sort of uh, non, no patterned uh, uh, syllabic words or somewhat patterned syllabic words. We've actually not been able to find any differences in their brain response at any age to these differences, but that, that's not relevant here. Um, and this is the probe set, and again, we're interested in uh, frontal parietal. We've looked at those analyses, and then also looked at just global connectivity differences, and this is analysis done by former postdoc Brandon Keene. And we saw that at six and nine months, there were no group differences. Where you see a negative here, this is the um, connectivity, uh, the low risk controls minus the high risk uh, for autism. This is suggesting that at three months, we see greater connectivity, greater, greater brain connectivity um, globally um, at three months, no differences at three and six months. And then by 12 months, we're seeing the same pattern that we saw in the ERP functional connectivity data. So it looks like there are significant differences um, at the very youngest ages, and then differences in developmental change over time in functional connectivity to language. Now what I want to do is to turn, I don't know how much time I have left, but okay, good. Well, that, um, Looking at baseline EEG, um, this is what Chuck Nelson spends his time doing, <laughs> that we can collect baseline data. The baby's sitting there on the mom's lap, and we uh, keep them occupied, either blowing bubbles or uh, anything to keep them as still as we can. In the end, we only need a couple of minutes worth, or even 30 seconds of consecutive EEG data for the analyses that I'll be talking about here. But you, you want artifact-free EEG, so you have to sort of do this for a little bit of uh, time to, to locate good, good data within that. 
And we started, this was um, Adrian Tierney's uh, dissertation research. And what she did was, a, a lot of what we do with the EEG is we um, extract the different um, uh, power frequencies and looking at developmental trajectories in low risk controls and in infants at high risk for autism, independent of outcome. We actually didn't know the outcomes for our babies back in 2012 when this was published. And what we saw was that these two groups show significant differences, and the earliest differences, this started at six months, okay? We only added in the three month uh, visit later. But we see maximal differences, particularly in uh, delta, beta, and gamma bands, um, early on, and then it looks like the brains of these babies uh, converge somewhat over time. But again, this is quite striking that very early on, these uh, brains are quite different. Once we added in the three-month data, okay, um, April Levin and Candice Varsin analyzed the data, and we saw at three months, lower power across most of the frequency bands between those two groups. And then when we looked just at, we were able to extract the infants later diagnosed with autism, we saw that they had the lowest power, particularly in beta and gamma. Again though, just extracting power, we see here that there's a lot of overlap in the groups and none of this would be useful from a predictive perspective. So then along comes Bill Bossel. Bill Bossel is a physicist, okay? He looks like a physicist, <laughs> and he thinks like a physicist, and he brings to our work the uh, tools and the mathematics uh, that allowed us to take this initial work on differences in um, in EEG power to a whole level uh, beyond which I can seriously say I follow the mathematics. So looking, using a whole variety of uh, nonlinear um, approaches to the signal, uh, to the EEG signal, okay. So he computed nine different nonlinear fe features, okay. Um, and these were each computed for the six frequency bands um, and for 19 channels. Instead of using the full 128 channels that we have, he just picked those uh, single channels that corresponded to the 1020 system, okay? And there's a fair amount of sort of error, you know, we didn't um, really check that the cap was the same uh, for all the infants we haven't uh, uh, you know, compared it to um, a model. But it's, it's about right, okay? Um, and what this does, what these features do, it provides uh, a very comprehensive uh, characterization. It's a bit black boxy though, okay? Exactly what any of these features, um, uh, what they're tapping in terms of brain dynamics, we really don't know. There's just a lot of hand waving, if that. Uh, think of it as just mathematical tools, if you like. Um, and we did this with uh, 30 seconds of consecutive uh, data. Um, and then taking a machine learning approach uh, to predict outcome classifications. Um, you have autism, you don't have autism, okay? Uh, and depending on your, um, your group from the beginning, if you could have been a low risk control infant with an autism outcome. We did have a couple of those, um, or a high risk who did not end up um, diagnosed with autism. Okay, uh, and what we did with the, the machine learning, they trained on the, if you like, those two extreme groups. Remember the HRA group who don't end up with autism are always somewhat in the middle. Okay, they're messy, they mess up everything. So they would, the, the model the, was trained on, or the models, because there's multiple models, uh, done at, at each, if, uh, separately at each different um, age point, were trained on ASD uh, versus low risk controls. And these are the findings, the positive predictive values. 
if you look at the blue bars first, this is how well does the model do separating autism from low risk controls? And the answer is, well, it was trained on that as a model, but nevertheless, that's, that's pretty high, okay? What happens when you throw in the high risk infants who did not end up with autism? And what's quite striking is how high the positive predictive values are, especially at three and six months. And what's interesting, if you remember the Tierney data, as the infants get older, the brains somewhat uh, converge to the more normal brain, okay, to the low risk brain, I should say. Um, and certainly by 12 months, we're seeing um, a significant uh, dip, although, to be honest, at 0.7 for a positive predictive value, you're still not doing badly, okay? Um, we also uh, use the model to predict autism severity. So instead of taking a, a categorical approach, how severe would their autism be? And we used uh, the calibrated severity score from this diagnostic instrument uh, that we administer. Uh, and this is t on the 36-month ADOS scores. Um, and so it's a, a severity score. Um, and we compare, compared um, the actual measured, what, what the severity score from the infant to what uh, would be, uh, what was predicted from the model. And it actually did really pretty well. So we not only can, um, but of course, the groups are, are fairly distinct here because obviously the severity scores are significantly higher for the infants who ended up with autism. Can we see this sort of funny blip at 12 months? This is age along uh, the x-axis here. This blip at 12 months, um, uh, things are not going well at 12 months uh, in terms of, of, of what's happening with the, these infant the, uh, power. Okay. So to summarize, what I've shown you here is that there are many neural measures that we can uh, look at in the first year of life that differentiate to a better or not so good, greater extent in infants who are later diagnosed with autism. So even though behaviorally there's nothing different about these babies, they look like any other babies do. Um, at the neural level, we are seeing differences, both in terms of general brain function as assessed by EEG, but also in terms of functional organization. Um, in this case, I presented you work based on our, language, our speech paradigm, but we also see similar kinds of differences in uh, lateral, lateralization and functional connectivity when we look at um, infants' responses to faces, okay? Now, our measures of EEG power were most strongly predictive of autism outcomes, and most particularly in the very earliest months of life. So it's almost as if the babies come into the world with very, very different brains, okay? that are determined by their biology, by the genetics, because we're talking about a high-risk sample here, who um, there's already uh, the genetics in the family leading to autism. Um, but that over time, there's some uh, change. Uh, what's that psychology expression called? Learning? Um, uh, that, uh, okay. Uh, and we see differences in developmental trajectories in uh, the neural measures, which seem to bring them closer to the uh, controls versus the behavioral measures, which are separating them uh, over time. So let me, I do want to talk about the implications very quickly. I do think we're getting closer to achieving what's been our goal of very early biomarker diagnosis. This is, for this field, the holy grail, okay? Um, why? It opens the door to much earlier intervention. Of course, we don't actually know what we do with a three-month-old infant, but <laughs> someone will figure that out. Um, EEG happens to be something that would be quite feasible 
to introduce into a well baby visit. Um, but we don't know whether these biomarkers work for infants who are not at uh, genetic risk, okay? Um, so a lot of infants uh, don't have an older sibling and end up with autism. Uh, what about that older sibling? Would it have worked with them? And we don't know whether it distinguishes autism from other neurodevelopmental disorders because we failed miserably in capturing another disorder. And I want to leave you with what, to me, are the kinds of ethical challenges that now that we have a finding, here's where my worries actually begin. Okay, um, we can pr now provide very high predictive value information to parents. Your baby is going to end up with autism. Your baby isn't. Okay, um, eventually maybe we'll be able to do this prenatally. Okay, but the question is, are parents, and more broadly, is our society ready to receive information about behavioral disorders? In contrast to medical disorders, where this is also the holy grail, uh, long before symptoms emerge. I think we're talking about something. We can't take the idea of uh, diagnosing cancer before it emerges. I don't know that we can take exactly the same ethical thinking when we're talking about a neurodevelopmental disorder like autism. So this leaves me to thank my team, the people who did the work I reported here, many others who have contributed and continue to contribute over time, and our valiant research assistants. Um, and that's a picture from several years ago on the Cape, which you dragged me from this morning. <laughs> um, the funding for all our work, and most especially to the children and the families, um, without whom who really devote hours and hours and hours to this work. And thank you for listening. ...difference between the behavioral and the neural. Um, so I think we're not, the, the EEG power is not really picking up anything that's specific to sensory, very specific to sensory um, uh, functioning, to social functioning. Um, or if it is, there's multiple ways of doing that with your brain. Um, so the answer is, that's a hand-waving answer. We really don't know. Um, I, I, you know, I started out. Uh, Chuck is a, you know, world expert on early brain development. Uh, assured me, well, the idea of doing this is things will show up bef first in the brain and then in behavior. Yes, that's true. But why we're seeing these different developmental trajectories tells us the story is way more complicated than that. Um, and that there's so much happening in the first year of life uh, that's changing um, the trajectories of their brain development, and at the same time, what really is distinctive um, about brains in the second year of life that mark off autism. The answer is we don't know from this because the measures in the second year of life were not nearly as predictive. So it's, I think it's a complete paradox at this point. Because the work is so descriptive um, and we don't have, I think this points to the fact that we don't have a, as yet, a very sophisticated understanding of early brain development uh, that allows us, you know, I, I could give you all the usual, the pruning and the synapse for you know, I can throw out a lot of buzzwords, but the truth is we don't really know the details.
I would say at this point we've we've looked a lot at our uh, at the different measures. Um, the the behavioral measures have been less revealing uh, in terms of group differences. Um, uh, but we also see, again, what seems to be important is differences in developmental trajectory and rate of change over time. Um, we've got some provocative emerging findings, um, but, uh, you know, uh, while we have a substantial sample, it's still a relatively small one. And everything I spoke about here today is something that requires replication before we go out and stick EEG machines in any uh, doctor's office. We have to, we really need to replicate this. I'm not, you know, and I don't know whether we'll replicate it, but it's pretty exciting for where it is. But the behavioral measures were, were less, because these are, this cohort of infants is actually um, relatively mild, um, mildly affected. So their severity scores, although more severe, than uh, the low risk controls, nevertheless, they're fairly, they're fairly mildly affected. Um, and part of that is as soon as we see any signs of concern um, in the baby at much earlier visits, even before we'll say this is autism, you know, we advise the parents, they, they get early intervention. So most of the, it, uh, I think every single one of the autism outcome babies uh, had pretty high levels of early intervention available. Um, so it's all complicated by that. And the early intervention works on behavior. We actually don't know how it affects the brain. That's another study. Um, another time I'll speak about that. We don't actually have findings yet anyway. But so it's a good question. So thank you for having, having me, and I just want to say that um, my son is actually a graduate from the study we talked about, so I know it really well. Um, so my name is Ola ozernov palchik I'm a postdoctoral associate at John Capriali's lab at MIT, and I study developmental dyslexia, uh, which is a prevalent learning disability that affects 5 to 17 percent of all children. It is unexplained, so it's not due to access to schooling or another underlying uh, disability. It is persistent, it can affect individuals throughout adulthood. It is hereditary and it has a neurobiological basis. So individuals with dyslexia often demonstrate structural and functional typicalities in brain regions that are important for reading. And trying to understand what are the underlying causes of dyslexia is sort of difficult because we are not born with a reading brain. We are born with a brain that can see, hear, process language, pay attention, and it is through the experience of reading that all of those networks come together to form the reading brain. And so a deficit in any of those uh, systems can lead to reading impairments such as the one we see in developmental dyslexia. And there are multiple theories that have emerged to explain the heterogeneity of those deficits, often conflicting theories. And it's possible that maybe dyslexia is a heterogeneous disorder with mul multiple causes, or we're just not measuring um, the deficits accurately. Um, furthermore, to make things even more complex, uh, reading evolves within kind of a context of environment and hereditary factors that interact probabilistically. Uh, to increase someone's risk for developmental dyslexia. So there are multiple factors to con uh, consider. And so in order to understand what factors cause reading failure and dyslexia, it is important to study those factors prior to reading onset, before those deficits are confounded with reading failure and reduced reading experience. Um, and so it is important to study the deficits in dyslexia in pre-reading children. And this has been kind of the course of my research study, uh, the researching early attributes of dyslexia studies, collaboration between John Gabriel at MIT and Nadine Gab at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital. And the goal of the study is to identify behavioral and neuroimaging predictors of dyslexia in pre-reading children. So it's a longitudinal study. We went into 21 schools in New England. We administered a brief battery of assessments to over 1,400 children. And those assessments have been shown to be predictive of reading outcomes when administered in kindergarten. 
Uh, and we followed, we invited a subset of the children, so 180 children, uh, to MIT for neuroimaging. And then we followed these children longitudinally until the end of end, first grade and until the end of second grade when a diagnosis of dyslexia can be established. And I wanted to see, first of all, whether if we look in kindergarten, with whether we see this heterogeneity of performance on preliteracy measures. And so we used a data-driven uh, approach, it's latent profile analysis, on five measures uh, that we, whoops, five measures that we administered in kindergarten, those are the predictive measures of reading outcomes, and we found that there are six profiles of performance on these measures, and those profiles are distinct as early as kindergarten. So for example, uh, this red profile of performance, uh, we called it letter sound knowledge risk. These children performed selectively poor on letter sound knowledge measure, but within an average scale across all the other measures. We then looked at the subset of these children, so those are the children who participate in the neuroimaging portion of the study, two years later at the end of first grade, and what we found is, first of all, there was 100% stability within the profile membership across those years. So children who were at risk in kindergarten remained at risk at the end of first grade. But also when we administer a much wider battery of assessments, and here we use the assessments that are commonly used with individuals with dyslexia, reading measures, language measures, cognitive measures, we were able to characterize really well those risk profiles um, based on those measures. So for example, that one group that I showed you in red, uh, the letter sound knowledge risk group, showed selective deficit in performance on connected text measures, so they had poor comprehension skills um, as compared to their just reg regular single word identification uh, skills. So this is kind of the poor comprehender profile that often is emerges, emerges in literature on reading. So essentially what we're showing is that those early risk profiles in kindergarten could potentially reveal different subtypes of dyslexia at the end of second grade. So that heterogeneity is already existing prior to reading failure. We were interested to see whether those risk profiles are also associated with distinct brain alterations. So we used voxel-based morphometry, and I just have to mention those are preliminary findings. We need to include more kiddos in our studies uh, to kind of increase the power and get c uh, corrected results. Uh, but we compared each of the average groups with each of the risk groups to see whether, there are vox, uh, whether there's great brain matter volume differences between the groups. And we found that each of the risk groups had unique patterns of brain matter volume reductions in brain regions that could potentially kind of illuminate of what it, the subtype is all about. So for example, that red group I showed you before had uh, reduced gray matter volume in bilateral temporal parietal regions. On the left, those regions have been associated with letter to sound mapping, and on the right, it's been associated with semantic processing. And then we looked at this, uh, this group at the end of second grade, so I showed you at the end of first grade, so this is three years later, this group is showing a poor comprehender profile again, which is in line with kind of the brain, um, the brain patterns of reduction we see in kindergarten. And the finding that those brain differences we see in dyslexia already predate reading failure and are evident in pre-readers are in line with other findings we have on the study. So here we found that uh, children who were at risk for dyslexia in kindergarten show reduced white matter coherence on the left arcuate fasciculus. This is a pathway that connects the Broca area with the Wernicke area and it's a pathway that's very important for reading development and children who were at risk in kindergarten already showed those alterations in this pathway. We also, uh, our collaborators at Children's Hospital also demonstrated that we can see the reduction, uh, the reduced fractional isotropy, which is reduced coherence in this pathway in infants at risk for uh, dyslexia, based on familiar risk of dyslexia. So, so those uh, markers of, or markers or uh, alterations we see in dyslexia predate reading failure as, and are present as early as infancy. Uh, as, as we all know, that reading development occurs in the context of environment and affects socioeconomical status, SES, is a significant predictor of reading outcomes, both historically and across the years of schooling. So we wanted to see whether in our sample we see uh, this um, interaction. And so we found that if you divide children based on high and low SES, and, we'll, and we used here parental education as an index of SES, and it's a very reliable um, measure across literature, and we look at kindergarten risk versus no risk, and then we look at those children divided into poor and good readers based on their second, ra uh, second grade reading performance, we see that while well, 16% of children who were at risk in kindergarten in the high CS group developed into poor readers, 
44% of children who were in the low SES group developed into poor readers. So we can see this inter uh, that SES modulates the risk reading outcomes in a way that potentially in higher SES families we have much more uh, resources available to buffer those early risks um, in reading. We also found that if we look at the, th at the pathway that's also important for reading, it's the left ILF, it's inferior longitudinal fasciculus, it's the pathway that connects the visual word form area, the, uh, uh, a region that emerges specialization for recognition of words with experience for reading. We see reduced coherence against reduced fractional anisotropy in this pathway in children from, uh, uh, from lower um, income, uh, lower SES families as compared to children from higher SES families. So. We can see here, this is years of maternal education, and this is uh, the values of fractional isotropy from these significant nodes uh, in the left ILF. So children who had more years of maternal education had increased coherence of this pathway. We were also interested to see whether this reduced coherence is associated in some way with reading outcomes at the, at the end of second grade. So reduced coherence of left ILF, correlated with second grade reading outcomes. And we found that in fact in lower CS children, this relationship existed, so lower uh, fractional anisotropy in this pathway was associated with poor reading outcomes at the end of second grade, but this was not the case for our higher SES families. Again, suggesting that um, SES modulates the risk and reading outcomes. And finally, we believe that our research has implications, and if we're talking about trends in cognitive science, there's a lot of um, kind of emergence of neuroimaging methods and a, a lot of big questions on how all this methodology can inform education, can actually change children's lives. And we believe that some of these findings, first of all, indicate that we should really move beyond the waiting to fail approach that's currently implemented in the school systems where a child is diagnosed with dyslexia when reading failure occurs, usually in second or third grade, but by that time they've been struggling with learning to read for many, many years, and they hate school, and studies show that interventions are more effective earlier on in kindergarten. We can also potentially, neuroimaging measures can potentially reveal the etiological mechanisms of dyslexia. So we can see that uh, by, class by trying to recognize and classify the pat patterns of alteration in pre-reading children, we can understand how those uh, deficits emerge in the reading brain. And finally, our SES findings show that whatever resources are available in our high SES group to kind of buffer those early risks should really be available in our low SES group. So this finding suggests that early interventions are important to optimize the reading outcomes of children from lower SES backgrounds. Thank you. That's a very good question. So actually when we looked at the different profiles, we found that the most severe profile, um, the one that ended up, when we look at the end of second grade, is sort of the classical dyslexia profile, was not overrepresented in lower SES schools. So we looked at uh, schools. So those were distributed equally across all the schools. But if you look at some of the other risk profiles, they were overrepresented in our lower SES schools. So this is for the larger sample. Uh, 1,400 children. So this is a really good question. There's a bit of debate uh, in terms of what is, um, when they said that dyslexia is independent from access to schooling, but yet you do see a child who is struggling to read, well, first of all, we need to make sure that we give them the intervention, but second of all, can, how can we dissociate those profiles from environmental factors, genetic factors, and how do they interact in each of those profiles? So it's, yeah. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kate Bentley. I'm a clinical and research fellow at the Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School. Um, I want to start today by thanking you all for having me and this is really an exciting opportunity to be able to present and hear all the other wonderful talks today. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about some of the work I've been doing on transdiagnostic psychological interventions for suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Um, so in terms of what I'll do in these next 10 minutes, I'm going to start by providing a brief overview of my program of research. Um, I'll then introduce the concept of transdiagnostic emotion-focused psychological treatment and some of the work we've been doing applying these strategies to suicidal thoughts and behaviors specifically. And then I'll end with some next steps. 
So broadly, my research is focused on the development, evaluation, and dissemination of evidence-based psychological interventions for self-injurious thoughts and behaviors and frequently co-occurring disorders. Um, I also have an interest in efficient and scalable treatment approaches, um, meaning that they're time efficient, cost effective, and as streamlined as possible, so accessible by many people in need. And lastly, I'm interested in applying real-time methods of digital monitoring and intervention, both to better improve our understanding of why self-injurious thoughts and behaviors occur, and ultimately be able to provide support in real time when it's most critically needed. So first off, transdiagnostic. What do I mean by transdiagnostic treatment? Um, when I say transdiagnostic treatment, I mean that instead of being developed for one mental health or psychiatric disorder, we think about transdiagnostic interventions being applicable across a broader grouping of disorders, and specifically targeting shared functional processes by a certain group or category of diagnoses. So my work has focused on emotional disorders. This means anxiety, depression, PTSD, OCD, somatic symptom disorders. So why is there a need for transdiagnostic approaches? Um, for one, over the past dec couple decades, many different evidence-based treatments for specific disorders has been, um, have been developed. Though these protocols were initially designed to facilitate training in evidence-based treatment, there are now so many of them, this is just a few listed here, that it's really difficult for providers to become trained in all of them. Second, there's also a great deal of phenotypic or symptom level overlap across the emotional disorders, which suggests that these conditions may be more similar than they are different. And third, there are also very high rates of comorbidity among the emotional disorders, um, which can make it difficult for providers to choose which disorder do I target first. So the Unified Protocol is a transdiagnostic treatment that our team at Boston University, led by David Barlow, my graduate school mentor, has been working on over the past decade. Um, the UP is a cognitive behavioral treatment that targets core temple mental processes that underlie the range of emotional disorders. Typically delivered in 12 to 20 individual outpatient sessions, so we'll talk about some modifications to that that we're doing now in a moment. Um, and our thought is that the UP may offer a more cost-effective and time-efficient approach to some of these more traditional single diagnosis protocols I was showing a moment ago. So in terms of what the UP actually does, um, we have five core treatment modules, mindful emotion awareness training, which we heard a little bit about earlier on with mindfulness talk, cognitive flexibility, also countering emotional behaviors, fostering interoceptive awareness and tolerance, and also emotion exposure. And the idea here is that, here is that each of these key treatment, treatment strategies targets these shared underlying features of emotional disorders, namely intense and frequent negative affect and aversive reactivity to the experience of emotion. And in turn, we hypothesize that by targeting these shared features head on, we'll ultimately see, re ultimately see reductions in emotional disorder severity and impairment. So, so far, most of the empirical evidence we have is um, on using the UP for primary anxiety and depressive disorders. And we also have some preliminary evidence for other conditions like PTSD, borderline personality disorder, eating disorders, and then some recent work on non-suicidal self-injury. Now I'll transition to some of the work we've been doing on applying this treatment model to suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Um, these phenomena, as many as you know, of you know, often co-occur with emotional disorders and also non-suicidal self-injury. Um, also clearly, as you're all aware, suicide is a huge public health concern currently. Um, these statistics, I believe, are fairly alarming. They show that since 1999, the rates of completed suicide have steadily increased. This is despite more and more research aimed on suicide prevention. Um, I'm not presenting these data today, but recent studies have also, sh also shown that for some age groups, the prevalence of non-fatal suicide attempts and suicidal ideation has also increased. So clearly there's a need for improved treatment and prevention approaches. Um, unfortunately, despite these statistics, there are surprisingly few evidence-based treatments out there for suicidal individuals. This is especially the case in inpatient settings that tend to see the most high-risk individuals, but where very little treatment evaluation research has been conducted. Um, this isn't surprising because there are notable barriers to implementing evidence-based psychological treatments on inpatient units. Um, for one, training in these protocols is often very expensive and time-consuming, 
And also the patients seen on these units, units tend to be diagnostically complex, which makes those single disorder protocols less well suited. Um, so we thought that the UP might be a treatment approach that's um, both applicable to individuals experiencing suicidal thoughts and behaviors, as these phenomena often serve the function of managing or escaping very intense unwanted thoughts or emotional states, um, and also because suicidal thoughts and behaviors tend to co-occur with emotional disorders, the UP may offer a more comprehensive and efficient treatment approach. So a couple years ago, we, our group did an initial proof of concept study um, of a modified version of the UP on an acute crisis stabilization unit at Boston Medical Center. Um, following some promising initial findings in terms of feasibility and acceptability, um, we've been conducted by uh, excuse me, contacted by a number of different researchers and clinical settings that are hoping to implement the UP on their own inpatient units. Um, so most recently, we've been working with the Amita Health uh, Behavioral Hospital System outside Chicago to implement the UP throughout their hospital system. And I'll talk a little bit about that research effort now. Um, so this has required a lot of um, modifications to the UP. Um, for one, treatment is entirely rolling admission on this unit, which means that we need to make each treatment session stand alone. Second, treatment is entirely group-based. And third, the average length of stay is five to eight days. So we have to pack a lot of content into a relatively short period of time. We've been doing this through an iterative process of modifications and getting very detailed clinician and patient feedback. Um, we've taken a peek at results so far and um, focusing primarily right now on acceptability and feasibility. We're seeing that um, patients generally like the treatment, rating it as acceptable on that of almost 3.9 on a zero to five scale and that also it's feasible to deliver. Um, this means that unit clinicians are generally adherent in delivering the protocol. We've also taken a look at outcomes so far. Um, so what we're seeing here, I know it's a busy table, orient you to it. We have pre-UP and post-UP. So the, we've looked at the data from admission to discharge of patients who were admitted in the months prior to UP implementation and then in the six months after UP implementation. So we have 133 patients in the pre-condition and 66, 61 patients in the post. So we're looking at outcomes in terms of depression, suicidal ideation, anxiety, and emotion regulation, each on a different row. Um, again, I won't go into the specific numbers. I'll tell you the key findings. What we're seeing here so far is that generally the magnitude of change is greater um, in the post-UP implementation condition. Um, the effect size are also um, slightly greater magnitude in the post-UP condition, but that said, the between condition differences are not statistically significant. That may, be, that may um, change once we have more patients, but so far we're not yet necessarily seeing superior outcomes. But that said, the goal of this implementation is to provide a larger, uh, more consistent therapeutic framework across the hospital. So in terms of next steps, um, first and foremost, we need larger scale controlled trials of transdiagnostic emotion focused treatment for self-injurious thoughts and behaviors. I'm currently conducting a study of a group-based unified protocol for a group at particularly high risk for lethal outcomes. So young adults with substance use disorders and co-occurring depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, or self-injury. This is over at MGH. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm also working to incorporate more real-time methods of both detecting acute changes in emotional distress or risk for self-injurious thoughts and behaviors with the goal of ultimately providing support in real time. You can think of the possibility of being able to objectively see on some of these wearable devices or other tools if someone is experiencing an acute change in emotional distress or risk for suicidal behavior and being able to prompt a real-time intervention, potentially using content from the unified protocol to help them regulate and manage their distress. Um, and this work is in collaboration with um, the Knock Lab at Harvard. So I'd like to thank my mentors and funding support. And thank you for your attention.
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we get that a lot. So there are certainly some similarities. Um, what we see is the difference with the UP is that each of its core treatment strategies is targeting a similar kind of functional mechanism that's maintaining emotional disorders. So this frequent and intense experience of negative affect coupled with aversive reactivity. Um, DBT, there's a, there's a lot in that treatment. It's a lot of different skills um, and it's more multifaceted, whereas the UP is very mechanistically focused. So we wouldn't necessarily say that the unified protocol is going to be effective for any type of um, dysregulation or psychiatric diagnosis, really only if the problem is maintained by this kind of underlying mechanism. So I'd say it's more, it's, um, there's a more kind of consistent singular mechanism of the unified protocol, more streamlined, um, but of course there is, there's certainly overlap with DBT as well. Thank you. Next up, we have Rose Cooper. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Rose. I'm a current postdoc at Boston College, and today I'm going to talk a bit about long-term memory in adults with autism, uh, specifically episodic memory, which is our ability to uh, remember and reflect upon specific past events in our lives. And this is something that's extremely important for how we develop, how we learn, and also how we maintain social relationships. However, in autism spectrum disorder, a number of different experimental paradigms, including autobiographical recall, subjective judgments of recollective experience, and also memory for contextual details of events, have all converged on this common finding that recollection of specific event details is reduced in this population. But exactly how and why this occurs is still up for debate. So one important thing to consider here is that memories um, for past events are not simply retrieved or forgotten in this all or none manner, but are actually reconstructed. Uh, so for example, the amount and quality of retrieved details can vary over time. And also these aspects of memory are influenced both by processes at the initial encoding or experiencing of the event itself, and also when we come to retrieve that event subsequently. So how are these factors affected in autism? Well, most research to date has placed a lot of emphasis on this initial encoding um, and experiencing of events as being different. So for example, a more item-specific focus of attention leading to memories being reduced in terms of more contextual details later on. However, a lot of research hasn't really systematically dissociated these two stages of memory. And this is particularly difficult in behavioral paradigms where really the only way of assessing if information has been learnt is to assess how that information is retrieved later on. So I'm gonna present two uh, studies that I ran towards the end of my PhD that really aim to get at this problem. So one method that we can use to dissociate memory encoding and retrieval is to use eye movements to look at both stages of memory separately. So we had uh, two groups of participants, adults with and without autism, conduct this memory task where we asked them to learn the appearance of these seen images here and then complete a memory test on them later on where they were simply asked to discriminate between uh, scenes that they had studied before and these new scenes here. And crucially, these new images are perceptually very similar to ones that they had studied before, but they're fundamentally different. And we also asked them to subjectively report if they could recollect the original appearance of the images that they studied. Um, and behaviorally, as we would expect based on previous literature, we indeed found that our, our ASD group um, showed reduced recollection on this task. So they showed a reduced ability to distinguish between the old and new scenes in this memory test. So looking at eye movements during encoding, we actually found very similar patterns of eye movements to these seen images when they were being studied. So both groups tended to fixate on very similar features of the images over a similar time course. And overall, across this encoding phase, an increase in the amount of eye movements or number of fixations to these images tended to boost overall subsequent memory, suggesting that fixations during this time are really serving to accumulate information that would help subsequent memory later on. However, the good thing about eye movements is that we can actually look on the trial specific or event level and see how the number of fixations to any specific image can allow us to predict if that individual image will be later remembered or forgotten. 
And when we look at this, we can see in our control group that images that had a higher number of fixations, eye movements during encoding, were the ones that were more likely to be remembered later on. However, in our ASD group, uh, this relationship simply wasn't there, suggesting this dissociation between uh, mechanisms, at least as evidenced by eye movements during initial encoding and subsequent memory. Then turning to memory retrieval, we actually found that our ASD group also showed reduced reinstatement of eye movements. And this is reflected in a reduced overlap between the pattern of eye movements made when encoding a scene originally and the pattern of eye movements made when retrieving that exact same image later on, even in instances of successful recollection. So to us, this suggested that memories, even when they're being retrieved, are not being reconstructed or experienced in exactly the same way. But exactly how? So the next experiment um, I'll present aimed to test two possibilities for this. So one is that memories are reduced in a quantitative manner, meaning that past events are remembered with fewer details. Alternatively, it could be that memories um, are retrieved with the same level of information in autism, but actually the information is less precise or more GIS-like. So for this experiment, we again uh, had two groups of participants, adults with and without autism, complete a memory task, this time in an MRI scanner, and we asked them to learn the appearance of a series of objects. And these objects were presented in three different features. First, in color, that was sampled from a continuous color spectrum, orientation, and also location in 360 degree space on this screen. And then during the memory test, we asked them to dynamically recreate the appearance of each object that they had studied. So they would take this object here and move it around the screen back to its original location. They would turn the object and then they would change the color of it, cycling through this color spectrum to try to make the final version appear as close to how they remember seeing it when they studied it during encoding. And the good thing about this type of memory task is that now rather than having simply a binary measure of correct or incorrect on every trial, we actually have a continuous measure of performance. So on every trial, we have an error, which is the distance between the uh, response the participants made during the memory test and the original value of the feature as they had studied it. And plotting these responses across um, all trials in the experiment, you would see a distribution that looked a bit like this where you would expect that most responses would be clustered around the correct value, so an error of zero in this case. And then what we can do is also fit a model to these data that allow us to differentiate memory quality from memory quantity. And the way this works is that we estimate memory precision, so the quality of recollection, as the width or concentration of participants' responses around this correct value. Alternatively, we can also estimate memory success or the probability of successful remembering from this random distribution of responses that fits a uniform component which would indicate guessing on any given trial. So our first uh, neuroimaging analysis, just focusing it on our control group, aimed to test if these distinct memory processes are actually represented differently in the brain. And indeed they do seem to be, so regions such as the hippocampus here coded for retrieval success. So activity of this region was responding to the number of features that people were able to remember about the objects. Alternatively, regions such as the angular gyrus here seem to care for about memory precision. So if you have remembered something, how, uh, how precise was that feature? Turning to uh, behavioral performance in our two groups, interestingly, we only found that this retrieval success process was reduced in our autism group, but not memory precision. So you can see this from the two groups' response distributions here. We found a very similar uh, concentration of responses indicating similar memory precision, but our ASD group were more likely to guess on any given trial. And this suggests that they were remembering fewer features about the objects that they had studied overall, but the ones that they did remember were remembered just as precisely as seen in our control group. Um, and the last analysis we conducted um, to compare our two groups was to look at functional connectivity, so communication between different brain regions. Um, and here we actually found a selective change in hippocampal connectivity. And as I just mentioned, the hippocampus is a region that cares about this retrieval success or more quantitative process. 
And here, during memory encoding, we found that the hippocampus communicated very similarly with regions of this frontoparietal control network in our two groups. However, during memory retrieval, communication between the hippocampus and these cortical areas really seemed to break down. Um, and this suggests to me that memory representations of these features coded for by the hippocampus are possibly not being communicated as effectively to these cortical areas that we know are particularly important for this explicit recollective experience during memory retrieval. So to summarize, uh, we believe that this evidence suggests that memory and autism um, is also affected by a distinct difficulty in retrieving and uh, maintaining these internal representations of past events. And actually, this is very much in line with a lot of evidence that suggests that memory and autism is overly context dependent. So you have to be in the physical context in which you experienced an event in order to freely retrieve it. And this could be associated with reductions in hippocampal connectivity. Also, something that this research has highlighted to me is that using these more continuous measures of memory can really um, open up quite um, a wild field of view into the very nature of these more complex naturalistic episodic memories. And these are the methods that I'm currently using in my postdoctoral work where we're investigating how different brain networks might interact to produce the specific composition and quality of our um, episodic memories and also how emotion might modulate these neurocognitive processes. So thank you to everyone at Cambridge, where I did my PhD, uh, my lab at Boston College, and to you for listening. something that we can't tell with this data. So one thing that's extremely important to follow up on is actually at what stage this difference is occurring. So we don't think that there may be some difficulties with the initial encoding, but there at least seems to be a distinct problem happening after that. But with these types of memory tasks, we really can't tell what's happening in that intervening stage. Um, one thing that's related to that is there is evidence that emotion influences memory differently in autism. Um, and that is largely thought to be a consolidation issue uh, where altered connectivity of the, hip, um, the amygdala and hippocampus might modulate that. But in terms of these types of tasks, it is quite a bit difficult to tell. Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, so we don't have any like reward manipulations in these types of experiments. But just like anecdotally, um, overall, I found that our ASD participants were actually far more motivated to do the experiments than our control participants. So just in terms of pure effort, I would highly doubt that that would explain the difference in memory performance. But again, we don't actually have measures to speak to that. We did, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, so I looked at pupil dilation really as a measure of like attention to the images. And overall, we actually didn't find that that showed any differences between the two groups. It was mainly the uh, fixation patterns that showed some differences. Um, but I know other research has found differences in pupil diameter, so I don't know if it was a data noise quality or, yeah. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for uh, joining us for the first half of TIPS. We have a whole second half coming up, um, but for now we're going to take a coffee break. So we have some um, cookies and coffee and tea. Um, okay, everyone. So we'll get started as people start to trickle back in. Welcome back or welcome uh, if you weren't here before. Um, uh, Tessa is going to introduce um, our next speaker. Um, again, same format as previously. So we'll, we have a featured speaker, um, which for this symposia, uh, symposium is going to be Dr. Ayana Thomas. Um, and then we're going to have three uh, flash talk speakers um, by trainees and research fellows and postdocs. Um, so I'll leave it to Tessa. Hello, my name is Tessa Charlesworth, and I'm a member of the TIPS organizing committee. And I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Ayana Thomas. 
Dr. Thomas is an associate professor of psychology at Tufts University, as well as the director of their graduate program. I first had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Thomas speak last fall here at Harvard, where she spoke about our field's current understanding of eyewitness memory. What was remarkable about Dr. Thomas's talk was that she discussed not only what happens when our memories are false or wrong, but also what factors make them better or more accurate. This approach has clear implications for our scientific understanding of the representation and mechanisms behind learning and memory, but it also has clear implications for positively impacting our criminal justice and our legal systems. And this is a, a theme that seems to pervade Dr. Thomas's work. Whether it's improving the memory of students taking stressful tests, or of older adults in their daily lives, or of eyewitnesses providing testimony. Her research is aimed towards having a positive Im social impact, all, all while advancing our understandings of basic cognitive science. And it is for these reasons that I'm very excited to hear her speak today on the inextricable link between metamemory and memory. Please join me in welcoming Professor Thomas. Thank you. It's really, truly an honor to be here and to give this presentation to you um, in this, on this warm day in a beautiful July. Um, so I wanted to talk to you today about why I think you can't really understand memory processes unless you think about metacognitive or metamemorial processes. So we're going to talk about that in the, through the lens of mostly eyewitness memory paradigms. But first, I wanted to talk to you about or introduce to you a broad and relatively influential uh, model for thinking about how memory, and I'm thinking about episodic long-term memory, so thank you for the previous speaker for setting me up, how episodic long-term memory interacts with metamemorial processes. So think about, for example, a student who is trying to master new material, or for you right now who maybe are sitting in this lecture hall thinking, hey, what might I take away from this particular lecture that I could apply in my own work? You are online trying to monitor your learning processes, and you might exercise some control over those processes, right? So you might maybe take a note. Uh, about something that was said that you find important, or you might write down a citation, for example. So those processes are happening likely at the encoding stage, when we're first introduced with information. However, we also engage in monitoring and control processes at retrieval. So if we think about what's going on at retrieval, or when you are asked to bring information back up to mind, how do you know? that that information that you're outputting is correct. If you're given the opportunity to exercise control over memory retrieval, what kind of control would you exercise? Well, I talk to students often about, well, when you first took, let's say, the SATs or maybe the GREs, I believe sometimes you're penalized if you guess and penalized less if you leave something blank. That kind of mechanism is a reward mechanism that forces the student learner, the test taker, to exercise control. The eyewitness to a criminal activity also can exercise control over output. That eyewitness can withhold information that he or she or they think is maybe less accurate. However, the kinds of instructions that eyewitnesses are forced to manage put these kinds of memory and metamemorial processes in conflict. So think about the eyewitness. The instructions when you're sworn in, if you've ever been sworn in, I have a lot at this point. <laughs> the instructions are to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. How does one engage in telling the whole truth, quantity, and nothing but the truth, accuracy? It's very hard to do that. Because often, if we're trying to be as complete as we possibly can in our recollective processes, that introduces error. We end up including information that we might be less certain about. And so what can we do to affect these kinds of control processes in the kinds of criminal justice systems where quantity and accuracy are important? So that's what I'm going to focus on today, hopefully. 
We'll see. And I'm going to do it by hitting on three important constructs that I see as operating for the eyewitnesses or the participants that we have in our studies. The first is information is power. That is, all we have to do sometimes is just tell people how memory works. And just by giving people a little bit of primer as to how memory works, they often are able to better exercise control over their memory output. They can regulate output if you give them instructions as to how to do so. But that regulation of output sometimes comes at a cost. Right? You might withhold information that was actually correct because you are now trying to be a little bit more conservative in your responding. And not surprisingly, this is not the same. This doesn't operate the same for everybody. That this kinds of, these kinds of processes of monitoring and control, as well as basic memory processes of retrieval, change as a function of normal aging. But they also are influenced highly by the kinds of emotional responses that we might be having at the time. So right now, I'm probably in the middle of a phase one stress response, which means my heart rate is up. I just had some caffeine as well, which has also influenced the kinds of cognitive operations I might be able to engage, including output. Um, we're going to talk about stress if I have time, but you never know. I might not. The first thing I want to talk about is information, information being power. And it's not information about what you had previously encoded or what you are trying to remember, but generally information about how memory works. And I know I'm sitting in a room of scientists who have some general conceptualization about how episodic long-term memory operates. However, even in this room, people still think their memories are going to be better than the average person. People in this room still think that if they were maybe a witness to a crime that was highly emotionally salient and stressful, that they would remember that information accurately. I know you would, because there's lots of data to support this. Most people believe that memory is reproductive in nature. Um, that belief results in limited critical evaluation of the kinds of things that come to mind. So if you are trying to retrieve some information and you don't contextualize it in the reconstructive nature of memory, you often will think that information is correct when it actually is not. But what I have found in the lab and also anecdotally with my husband, <laughs> is that if you simply say, hey, by the way, memory is reconstructive in nature, and this is what that means. This means that when you are trying to remember some past event, you are bringing up those bits and pieces. And sometimes those bits and pieces can get confused with other memories, and you can make errors. If you simply give people a little bit of information before they take a memory test, it affects their monitoring and their control of memory output. So we study this in the context of a variety of different paradigms. But today, I'm going to focus on an eyewitness memory paradigm. And in these studies, they typically hap happen in one single session, which is, is a really important phenomena factor that we can talk about if we have time. But in a single session, Participants will watch an event. If anyone has ever seen the 1956 movie Rafifi, you would not be able to participate in this study. But it's a French New Way film that most people have not seen. The nice thing about this movie is it has a 22-minute sequence in the middle of it where four men break into a, um, a vault, and they are stealing. They're engaging in this big theft. 22 minutes black and white, all in silence. So it's a great p stimulus to use in the context of these designs. After participants watch this 22-minute sequence, either with intentional memory instructions or incidental memory instructions where they don't know a memory test is coming, we then present them with a synopsis 
of what they just watched. So we say, hey, by the way, you just watched this video. Here's just a synopsis of what you saw. Enjoy. That synopsis, though, includes information that is consistent with what they just watched, that is neutral, that is, we don't change any of the details, um, we just restate a fact, or that is inconsistent or misleading, where we change a specific detail. So for example, if the uh, participants watched these men steal a, uh, I think it's a ring, that we might change that detail to necklace in the context of the narrative. So we can compare what happens across these three different kinds of items that are manipulated within the context of this narrative. For the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to focus on baseline details that aren't changed and um, misleading details that are changed. So again, after just a short retention interval, five minutes, participants take a forced recall, forced cued recall test. And this is important. It's forced in that we force participants to answer a question, answer every question that is presented to them. They cannot omit, they cannot leave an answer blank, and in fact, when they do, we actually try and prompt them to make a guess. So we want quantity at the potential cost of accuracy. In that particular design, generally we find what's known as a standard misinformation effect. That is, when people are presented with inconsistent information in the narrative, they output that inconsistent information on the final test of memory, even though that test of memory is about the originally witnessed event. However, when you give participants some information about how memory works, that information is power. And they can use that. I don't know why this is shifting on me. So there it goes. And they can use that um, to modulate their memory monitoring at retrieval and their memory output if we give them a free cued recall test. But just looking at when we force people to continue to respond, but we give them a warning right before that final test of memory. So they've witnessed the event, they've received the narrative that has inconsistent information, and then they get that final test of memory. But before that final test, they get a warning. Hey, by the way, some information was incorrect in there. Try and ignore the narrative, and just remember to respond with only the video. These are the data. So our no warning condition, this is from a paper that we published back in 2010, but I'll show you a more recent um, replication of this particular paradigm shortly. So you can see that when participants are not warned about how memory works, that's the standard misinformation effect. People are better when they are not presented with inconsistent information in the narrative than when they are. When they are presented with that inconsistent information in the narrative, these data suggest that they can no longer access the original event details. However, when you compare it to a warning condition, you see that we eliminate that problem of misinformation bias, that people can now think back to the original event memory and engage in what we might think of as retrieval-based monitoring. That is, maybe two pieces of information come to mind. I remember a ring. I also remember a necklace. But as opposed to just outputting the first thing that comes to mind, I now think about the source of that information. I now think about, hey, wait, maybe I watched it. I saw that ring. Or wait, I seem to remember something about the experimenter's voice. Using those subjective phenomenological cues to engage in what seems like effective source discrimination and appropriate retrieval output. So that's what happens when a warning occurs after people pre are presented with misleading post-event information. Now recently, I mean really recently, I think my grad student just gave me these data last week, um, and you can ask her because she's here all about them. Uh, recently we replicated this particular finding of a warning after. And we compared it to what happens when you're given a warning prior to getting that narrative. 
That is, you're going into the narrative, knowing a memory test is coming, and knowing that you're going to have to engage in source discrimination, or at least weigh two different pieces of information. What does that warning before you're getting that misinformation do? Absolutely nothing. It does nothing as it relates to getting rid of the misinformation effect. And these data, I think, are particularly important because it suggests that effective retrieval-based monitoring really can only occur when pe people have some idea of what they are trying to navigate between, when they have some access to two different sources of information, so they have something to anchor on this particular warning. When it happens earlier, they're not quite sure what to do, and those kinds of effects and memory error still emerge. So we have a lot of data looking at warning and how that affects output, but of course, we have 25 minutes, and I've used maybe 15 of them. So I will move on and just briefly summarize that, yes, warning does encourage retrieval-based monitoring, which has downstream consequences on regulation or control processes that the memory of what was witnessed cannot be understood without understanding the meta-memorial processes that are tied to what people are doing um, with that memory test. And what they're doing, I, again, I keep going back to this, is that they're regulating their output, that they are exercising some sort of meta-memorial control over what they are willing to provide versus willing to withhold. And when we give people, through a variety of different memory tests, the ability to exercise control, it really changes the pattern of data. What looked like age-related deficits in memory go away if you give older adults the opportunity to exercise control. So I want to show you some of those data and talk about the methodology that we use primarily behaviorally, to look at exercising control. Same paradigm, you watch video, short retention interval, you get a narrative that has consistent, neutral, and misleading information. After another short retention interval, you get a final test of memory. But this final test of memory is unique. Because first, as with interviews that officers conduct at the scene of a crime, it's forced output. That is, every question that is asked of the subject, of the participant in the study, is, re requires an answer, even if that answer is a random guess. And that forced output is followed by a free recall task. And when I say free recall, it's not in the traditional sense. What we do here is we give them back their answers and say, OK, these are the answers that you gave us. Now we just want you to circle the ones that you're absolutely sure about. And we're just going to omit the other ones. So now we're going to give participants the opportunity to exercise control. And we did this, again, comparing young adults. I forget where the study was done. Washington University in St. Louis. So young adults at WashU and older adults as members of that participant pool. And I'm going to show you what happens for both old and young adults. But first, let's start with young adults. Forced responding, standard misinformation effect. People are pretty good on control items. Not great, uh, but uh, they are impaired when they are presented with misleading post-event information. But when you tell them, hey, here are your answers. Just give us the ones that you are confident in and try not to guess this time. When you give them those instructions and they circle just the ones they want to keep on that test, this is what happens with accuracy. Now, an astute listener of this talk might say, OK, I see what you're doing here. What if people just circled one or two answers? That that accuracy came at the cost of correct quantity. That's not what happens. When we get, so we've looked at those losses, and in fact, the losses are minimal. Yes, some losses do occur, but it's usually one or two items out of a set of 24. So they are rather minimal 
when you compare it to the kinds of gains in accuracy that we see in young adults. So that post-event information, wait a second, I feel like I skipped over a bunch of stuff. No, okay, we're good. So that post-event information is relatively innocuous when you give people the opportunity to exercise control. That it doesn't overwrite the original memory. That it doesn't to totally disrupt access to the original memory if that original memory was encoded and people are given some ability to monitor and control output, they can do so with accuracy. Now this changes somewhat as we age. Same paradigm, in fact, the same experiment. Our young adult data, again, compared to older adults, again, from the same area, um, community dwelling participants who were all high-functioning older adults. They were like our professional subjects in St. Louis. Um, and you can see, though, you see a similar change from forced to free responding when they're told not to guess. But if you compare it to the young adult data, older adults are still not performing at the same level. We dug deeply into why older adults are still demonstrating a deficit. And they seem to have both metamemorial control output issues as well as deficits in encoding that we didn't control for in these original studies. So in subsequent studies, we have maintained um, a protocol that tries to match younger and older adults on encoding so that we can look at exactly what's going on at simply retrieval. And I agree, it is so hard to disentangle encoding from retrieval. So, um, so but we're gonna try that in the last few minutes. And I'm just gonna ask you how much time I have. I have four minutes, I can do this. Um, so older adults in this first study demonstrate some biased responding that's harder to override than what we saw with young adults, that they do seem to demonstrate a deficit in encoding in these early studies that we were able to control for. And I'm gonna to talk to you about one last study where we try to control for this problem with older adults, this deficit in encoding. So we could simply look at regulation of output. We did this in the context of inducing stress in our participants. So I said I was gonna talk about three important factors. That information is power, that that power allows us to regulate our output, but that regulation is affected not only by normal age-related changes in cognition, but also by our emotional states. So while my phase one stress response has dissipated, I am now in a phase two stress response where cortisol is probably flowing through the system. That cortisol has been shown to negatively impact memory retrieval in both older and young adults. So I'm gonna do two things with this last study. First, I'm gonna show you what happens when we try and match older and young adults on encoding processes to look at the regulation of output. And then I'm gonna show you what happens to both of these groups when we stress them out prior to taking that test. Same paradigm, but two crucial differences. The first is we introduce a 24-hour retention interval after participants are presented with the narrative, but before they take a final test of memory. And that was done in part to get people equated on what they still have access to, older and young adults, and also done in part so that we could introduce a stress manipulation designed solely to impact their memory retrieval. I'm gonna talk about that stress man manipulation in a second, but first I wanna show you what happens for young adults when they are not stressed and compare them to older adults when they're not stressed. So 24 hours later, regardless of whether they're engaging in forced or free responding, people have access to less information. This is not a big surprise as Ebbinghaus demonstrating a for, demonstrated a forgetting curve 150 years ago. But what you can see is that people, young adults here, are still making gains. 
they're not making dramatic gains between forced and free, response, free responding, but they are making some. And they're making it both on neutral and misleading trials. Older adults, not making as dramatic of gains as they did in the previous study. When you delay testing by 24 hours, older adults demonstrate these deficits in their ability to exercise control, especially when you compare them to their young adult counterparts in a cross-sectional design. However, I never think that older adults really have the deficits that um, some of our studies uh, over the last 40 years have suggested. In fact, I think that older adults are actually performing tasks very well. We just have to figure out how to ask them the questions in order to access memory. And so in this particular study, I've got two minutes left, um, we stressed them out to see how older and young adults would behave in this context, how they would exercise control. We use the, I had to think about which uh, stress manipulation we used. In this one, we used the Trier Social Stress Test. So for those of you who aren't familiar, this is a study, uh, or this is a design where participants are asked to give an impromptu speech that is evaluated by uh, experimenters, and then they have to do terrible complex math out loud. It's horrible, I hate it, I'm stressed out thinking about it. <laughs> But what you can see here is that before subjects, um, when subjects were not stressed, here are our young adult data. Here's our young adult data when subjects are stressed. That that stress actually results in greater gains in accuracy with no cost to control that's significant. That is, the withholding is the same between the non-stressed and stress group. But the stress group does a better job of engaging in retrieval monitoring and controlling output. That happens for young adults, and that happens for older adults. Caveat though, it only happens for one trial for older adults, control items and not inconsistent items, so I can talk to you about why that is potentially um, at a later date. But here we see that when we are in stressed, perhaps when we're on the witness stand, which is in fact stressful, that that kind of stress is going to result in caution in the kind of information that both older and young adults are outputting. And that's actually going to benefit um, the quality of their testimony. So this, in this case, physiological stress did result in gains in both accuracy and um, for older and young adults. And these gains didn't come at the cost of excluding information. So I'm gonna end here by, uh, anybody know, if you know the George Franklin case, you'll understand why this picture is particularly relevant in this context. Um, Franklin uh, was exonerated after serving many years on the uh, faulty testimony of his daughter uh, with regard to um, a horrific um, memory that she recovered. Uh, it is a great example of how memory is in fact reconstructive, prone to error, but people still tend to hold it to this sort of standard that it can be used in the context of criminal justice and convicting people. I spend a lot of time in the criminal justice system and I mostly work on cases where there is only one or two witnesses to an event um, because I find it frustrating that people can still be convicted on just the testimony of a single or two eyewitnesses. So, in conclusion, I just want to acknowledge um, the grad students, um, some of whom are here, that helped collect uh, some of these data, uh, and the funding sources that helped support the most recent versions of our studies. And I thank you for your time.
be using my pen to see it, it's just that the information that it may be wrong makes them kind of back with it a little bit. Do you know yeah, I do. So the first, um, so the first question about what I think the mechanism is uh, that underlies the misinformation effect. I think it's um, uh, retrieval accessibility. So when I'm, I ask you to answer a question, typically in these studies, what people tend to do is answer with the first thing that comes to mind. And if you design your study in a particular way, the first thing that's going to come to mind is the information that was very recently presented. And you're just not carefully engaging in sort of trying to access multiple pieces. When you force people to access multiple pieces, or when you encourage people to engage in um, explicit source monitoring, hey, did this come from source A or source B, then you actually see reductions and sometimes elimination of the effect altogether. Um, so the second piece of uh, your question was about what does the warning do um, to people's uh, confidence in their own uh, memory. And, and you're getting at something I think that's important, and that that warning is going to affect the different kinds of memory representations in different ways. So if something wasn't learned, that warning's not going to really have much an, a, of an effect on getting people to access what was originally presented, but it at least will allow them to withhold the information that was recently presented. When the, the subject has learned the two pieces of information, I do think that that warning is resulting in source discrimination. But you're right in that people can start to question, right? It's sort of like demand that I have told you, hey, I present you with a bunch of wrong information. Now I want you to doubt everything that's been presented. Uh, and we've looked at that in a couple of different ways. And one other way we've looked at it was by introducing a test after the uh, original event, but before the narrative and before a final test. And you can look at the change in responses, including what happens with and without a warning. Are people more likely to switch their answers? Or are they more likely to maintain their answers? And you can see that when people have correctly retrieved a piece of information, they continue to maintain that piece of information regardless of the warning. So that warning is not resulting in them sort of shifting their criterion and what they're going to output when they have access to that original piece of information. Hey, Tom. Um, with the stress test, do you think there's like a yerk dodson kind of effect where if they're too stressed, it actually makes their metacognition a little worse? Or is there like an ideal range? Yeah, uh, so I do think there probably is an ideal range. Uh, and I think that the question is both theoretically and practically important because you could think about witnesses, uh, especially victims. Um, and those victims actually having a stress response that's such that doesn't allow them to process any information further or the processing inherently changes so that they can't re-instantiate it later at later test. Um, I have not figured out a really great way to work, uh, to look at that in the context of the lab that doesn't violate um, ethics, right? You, you, there's only so much you can do to subjects. Um, and so, but I'd be really interested to hear about ways to get at that in humans and not in an animal model. Yeah. Do you think the stakes could modulate um, a witness's or a criterion, a threshold for volunteering for withholding information? So if the crime has a very sort of like low, uh, like if it's, I don't know, if it's like a bad felony versus like not such a bad crime, do you think that that would change the way witnesses report? That's such a really great question because I could see a way to actually measure that in the lab, which hasn't been done. I don't know why no one's done that, so I'm going to do that now. Thanks. <laughs> um, yes, I do think that, you know, for di so I do a lot, so I was doing district court cases and now I just do superior court cases, and you sort of see just the difference in the whole uh, structure of the way that that case unfolds, even when it gets to trial. And I do think that that's going to impact how the witness is going to respond. I think you're right. I just don't have any data to back it up. Yeah. Are there certain things about the American justice system that make this sort of problem uniquely prevalent? Um, yeah, there are certain things about the, uh, 
So the uh, focus, uh, well, uh, this is going to get into a social talk. Uh, so, so I will talk to you about what I think is a problem in the American justice system, <laughs> um, but I'm not going to do that right now. Um, I do think that we can focus on these things in the US, in Canada, in the UK, and in Australia. Um, but at, once we sort of broaden it, it, it becomes harder to make those kinds of leaps. Do I have time? Let's do one more. Okay. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you would expect to see the same effects on recognition versus recall, recognition being more relevant to like, police violence and stuff. Ollie, would you like to answer that question? She says no. Um, we just ran that. Um, and yes, uh, we see the same Im impact. Um, not surprisingly, uh, people have, when they can engage in both sort of recollective and familiarity-based processing and retrieval, they are able to access more information, but they make the same sorts of gains in responding um, if, you get, give the, if you ask them to exercise control. It's a good question. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna start our uh, series of three flash talks. Uh, first up, we have uh, Alona Bloom. Yeah, I think that's right. Bloom, yeah. Bloom. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks so much for having me here today. It's a real honor to be invited to speak at a symposium. Um, and today I would like to share some exciting new research from our lab looking into the nature of visual memories. So I'm gonna present you with a short video uh, in which you're gonna be walking along BU's campus. And a certain point on the left side of the screen, there will be a red circle appearing. And I want you to try and remember everything about this event. It will be a woman sitting on a bench, just so you know. Um, so we're gonna be walking down BU's campus. I don't know if anyone has been there. So on the left, it's a woman on the bench. And just try to remember everything what you just saw. So when I show this, I hope some people will be able to recall that uh, the woman on the bench had the back on the left, standing next to her. It's okay if you don't. Um, <laughs> but the question here is, how do we maintain such an event like this back in visual memory? So is an object like this bag an, an abstract concept, maybe supported by parietal or frontal brain regions? Or could we additionally see this as a perceptual representation supported by those sensory cortices that were important for the initial encoding of this stimulus? So previous work has shown that we are remarkably good at remembering fine details about a visual scene. So in this case, I'm showing this oriented stimulus. And after a short delay, a test pops up. But the participants are highly accurate at detecting this difference, even if it's not this easy, and with delays uh, up to 10 seconds. And this doesn't just hold for the orientation of this stimulus. This holds for various very basic visual features of an object or scene. And this has led to the proposal that in order to remember such a basic feature, those sensory areas, in this case visual cortex, must be important uh, for the maintenance of this stimulus. So neuroimaging studies or fMRI studies have examined this question and they looked whether visual cortex carries a representation of a remembered stimulus. So in this task, participants were shown uh, two oriented stimuli, uh, and after um, a cue would indicate which of the two they had to maintain in memory throughout a delay period, um, and then a test would appear and they would tell you whether it differed or not. So importantly, when they looked at the brain activity as measured with fMRI, the bold response, in this delay period, there was no different difference between these two oriented stimuli. However, um, there is information about the orientation the participants are remembering in patterns of bold responses. 
And this doesn't just hold for stimulus orientation. It's also been shown for the intensity of the stimulus or the contrast. And this raises an important question. What are these memory traces people find in these patterns of bold responses in sensory areas? And to what extent can they be compared to actually seeing the stimulus? So like a true perceptual representation. So in this study, we set out to test that question. Um, do visual memories function like perception? And to examine this, we looked whether memory um, and perception share a common neural computation, which is normalization. And let me explain to you what that is. So here I'm presenting two identical stimuli. Um, they have the same intensity or contrast. But when I place a surround in its close proximity, the perceived contrast on the left is much reduced. And this type of normalization is called surround suppression. And there's lots of evidence from various studies showing how responses to a center stimulus like this can be reduced by adding a surrounding stimulus. So could we still see such an effect on the perceived contrast when the surround is not presented at the same time, but instead you're actively maintaining a representation of that center contrast. So here, sorry, here we examine this question. Um, do visual memories undergo normalization? So in order to do that, we first need to quantify the magnitude of normalization that occurs during perception so that later we can compare it to the magnitude that we might see in visual memory. So we measured perceived contrast of a center stimulus for five different contrast levels under two conditions, a surround and a no surround condition. And participants were asked to maintain a representation of the center stimulus presented at the start of the trial until a probe appeared at the end. And then they were cued to dial the knob to like match the contrast to the one they were holding in memory. Here I plot perceived contrast as a function of the five contrast levels that we measured. And the black line indicates our no surround condition. And this does provides uh, a baseline measure for how well observers were able to replicate these various contrast levels. It's also evident that adding a surround uh, leads to a much lower perceived contrast of this center stimulus compared to this no surround condition. Thus, consistent with previous work, uh, we find normalization in perception. But to what extent does a visual memory representation also undergo normalization? So this trial sequence is almost identical to the one I just showed you, with the only distinction that the surround has now been pushed into the delay interval while you're actively holding a representation of the center stimulus presented at the start of the trial. Um, and again, participants uh, had to maintain a representation of the presented contrast and dialed a knob um, in order to match its intensity. So here, perceived contrast does not differ from the no surround condition when the center and surround are presented sequentially, so while you're holding the center in memory. Thus, perceived contrast seems to be only attenuated uh, in the direct presence of this surrounding stimulus. And to examine this effect in a bit more detail, um, we fitted this data with a variant of uh, a normalization model. Um, and in this model, the normalization strength parameter um, just represents the influence that the surround has uh, on the response to a center stimulus. So a positive value here means uh, that there was a stronger reduction in perceived contrast. And this nicely summarizes the data I just showed you, uh, indicating 
um, that there is no evidence for normalization within visual memory. Um, so it seems that while there are these patterns of the remembered stimuli within sensory cortices, this has been shown many times, um, these representations are distinct from truly seeing the same stimulus as they do not uh, succumb to normalization. So with that, I would like to thank uh, my advisor, Sam Ling, Melissa Kibbe, uh, my lab members, and all of you for your attention. Next up, we have Jacqueline Porch. Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you guys so much. This has been so much fun today. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some of my research that has looked at the effects of age on emotional memory processes, um, specifically looking at how age can interact with memory valence or how positive or negative a memory is. When thinking about the effects of age on emotional memory, um, a very commonly reported behavioral pattern is this age-related shift towards more positive memory retrieval, which can be very interesting and exciting because that sort of enhanced positivity may have some interesting consequences for how older adults view and interact with the world around them. In the literature, people have looked at these age bivalence interactions in a couple of different ways, with some studies looking at um, the availability of emotional information or the likelihood that a person will remember that an emotional event occurred. Uh, other studies have focused more on the phenomenology of these memories or the subjective qualities or characteristics of that memory during retrieval. We and other labs have shown that sometimes the effects of age on the vividness of a memory can differ as a function of valence with greater age-related decreases in negative compared to positive event vividness ratings. Today I'm going to be talking about two fMRI studies that have tried to examine the <coughs> mnemonic processes that might be supporting these age-related changes. So going into these studies, we had a couple of hypotheses about what might be driving these patterns. First, one very big difference between positive and negative memories in young adults is that negative memories tend to be more visually detailed, um, relying more heavily on recruitment of posterior sensory regions during retrieval. Now, we also know from the aging literature that older adults tend to under-recruit these same posterior sensory regions um, across cognitive tasks, which include um, memory, encoding, and retrieval. So perhaps older adults are having trouble recruiting these regions during uh, retrieval, leading to less vivid negative memory representations than what we would see in young adults. The second hypothesis um, comes from a different literature that instead focuses on the possibility that older adults have preserved or perhaps even enhanced emotion regulation abilities compared to young adults. Um, this literature, it's okay. This literature suggests that older adults may be more motivated to maintain positive affect during cognitive tasks, you know, decreasing negative and enhancing positive information accordingly. So it's possible that we're seeing less vivid negative compared to positive events in older adults, not due to an underlying deficit, but rather due to some prefrontal regulatory mechanism older adults are employing to decrease the vividness of their negative events during retrieval. So I mentioned that I did um, two different fMRI studies to try to answer this question. In the first, we wanted to focus on examining these emotional memory processes in a more controlled laboratory environment. So we conducted an episodic memory study that was conduct conducted across the adult lifespan here, ages 19 to 85, asking participants to encode word image pairs that consisted of a neutral title and a positive, negative, or neutral image. During a scanned retrieval task, participants were presented with a series of neutral titles and asked to respond using just an old new button press whether each title had been presented with an image during encoding. Uh, following their button press, they then were asked to elaborate on that memory in as much detail as possible for an additional five seconds, leading to retrieval trials that tended to last on average from seven to nine seconds. 
Now, again, this study was designed to try to understand emotional memory processes in this controlled laboratory paradigm. But sometimes that control can make it difficult to generalize findings to real world events. So again, what we're asking people to do here is remember emotional images that are relatively insignificant or inconsequential to their daily life, and also that were only encoded about a half hour to maybe an hour before retrieval. It is possible that people respond very differently when they're asked to try to remember something, an emotional event that happened in their own personal lives. So to try to understand these real world events, we also conducted an autobiographical <laughs> memory study looking at the same questions. This study, again, conducted across the adult lifespan, focused on participants' memories for the 2013 Boston Marathon bombings. We presented participants with 40 images related to the bombings, and for each, asked them to come up with a personal memory that related to that image in some way. Now, these images were specifically selected so, and pilot tested to make sure that they varied in how positive or negative they were, and to cover different aspects of the bombings. So that, well, I'm going to make it go away. OK, I'm not going to use the <laughs> thing. Um, <laughs> it ranged from the immediate sadness or anger of the aftermath to the heroics of the spectators and the first responders to then the many examples of memorials or town pride that happened in the following weeks. So again, participants were presented with each of these images and asked to come up with a memory, press a button once that memory was in mind, and then elaborate on that memory in as much detail as possible for the remainder of the 22nd trial. So you can see that there are several differences in the methodology across these two studies, but I'm kind of lumping them together here because we actually found converging patterns in our age effects across these two studies. First, across both studies, we found evidence that argue against that sensory deficit explanation for the reduced negative event vividness in older adults. First, that age by valence interaction that we were thinking we might see in posterior sensory regions was not apparent in either study. Second, although we were able to replicate those prior findings that older adults were under recruiting these posterior sensory regions during memory search, if we looked at a few seconds later in the retrieval trial, so if we just elongated our window, we saw this age by phase or age by time interaction where later in the memory retrieval trial, older adults were over recruiting or showing an increased recruitment of these same posterior sensory regions. And importantly, recruitment of these posterior sensory regions, regardless of when it happened during the retrieval trial, was related to later memory vividness. So because older adults were able to recruit these posterior regions in support of memory vividness and then consistently did so during these elongated trials, we feel like the sensory deficit explanation is not, uh, not appropriate in this case. However, we did find support for this prefrontal regulatory mechanism. Age was associated with greater increases in prefrontal recruitment during negative compared to positive event retrieval, with an age-related reversal in the function of the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. So while young adults, well in young adults, the DMPFC appeared to be working together with the hippocampus, so positive connectivity with the hippocampus um, in support of greater vividness ratings on a trial by trial basis for both positive and negative events, we saw the opposite happening during negative event retrieval in older adults, where in older adults, recruitment of the DMPFC on a given trial was associated with reduced vividness ratings and reduced hippocampal recruitment, suggesting that older adults may be recruiting this region in an effort to sort of de somehow downregulate the uh, vividness of their memories via the hippocampus. Now, critically, we found that this age by valence interaction and hippocampal connectivity. Um, we found it across the two studies using exactly the same hippocampal and DMPFC clusters. In other words, older adults are recruiting the same DMPFC region to decrease negative, or decrease negative event vividness and um, hippocampal recruitment during negative event retrieval whenever they're asked, 
whenever they're asked to retrieve a negative event, and that's regardless of whether that negative event is an image of a snake that they saw 30 minutes ago in the lab, or a highly emotional public event that occurred a year to a year and a half before participation in this study. We also have some evidence that I'll talk about in more detail one-on-one -on -one if anybody is interested, that this negative connectivity pattern that we're seeing is strongest in the older adults with the best brain and cognitive health. So in other words, it's the older adults who are able to recruit this mechanism who are doing so during negative event retrieval, as opposed to it being some sort of byproduct of age-related degeneration. Finally, we have um, one open question that we're currently working on is what exactly is happening? What are older adults doing when they're recruiting the DMPFC during negative event retrieval? One possibility is that they're retrieving these negative events the same way that young adults are, but then are employing emotion regulation strategies to reappraise the negative events in a more positive way, decreasing the impact that they have um, during the retrieval trial. Another option is that older adults are engaging in some form of memory suppression, where they're actually preventing the retrieval um, of memory details during um, the task and are not encountering them at, in any way. Um, we're currently working on a couple of different both behavioral and fMRI studies that are attempting to tease apart these two options. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much. Thank you to Elizabeth and the CAN, BC CAN Lab, and thank you to you. versus positive, so in the images you get about equal negative and positive. Here we have more positive and more negative memories, but because it's all a umbrella negative event, they all have some tinge of negativity to them, so that's young and older adults only. But in autobiographical memory studies, you tend to see the opposite. You tend to see everybody a little bit more positive than negative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have Juliet Davidoff. Okay, um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, today I'm gonna tell you about a study investigating the influence of value that's been learned in how it drives differences in exercising inhibitory control over development, and this is work that I've been doing here as a postdoc with Leah Somerville. So earlier this year, a very important event occurred in my life. A blue bottle coffee shop opened in Harvard Square. And I have had their coffee in San Francisco and in New York, and over many, many experiences, I have learned that I really love their coffee. And we know from a lot of other work that rewards are important for understanding how uh, adaptive behaviors guide us towards our goals. So if my goal is to work on a manuscript, then coffee might facilitate writing. But if my goal is to come and attend this conference and then I'm going to go and get stuck in a very long line, I could miss out on hearing some of these brilliant speakers. So I should stop myself from going to the blue bottle in this case. And even if their coffee is valuable to me, depending on the context, I need to be able to control my behavior and accordingly uh, adjust my uh, actions to meet my goals in this particular moment. And we know from a lot of previous research that representing information about value uh, and controlling our behaviors rely on different parts of the brain that are located within the prefrontal cortex. 
And we also know from a largely separate literature that the prefrontal cortex is a part of the brain that um, continues to mature throughout adolescence and even into young adulthood. And that means that the capacities to control our behaviors and represent values are also changing as individuals age. And so for today, I'm gonna to focus on two areas within the prefrontal cortex, the inferior frontal gyrus and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And uh, the inferior frontal gyrus, uh, from a lot of literature, um, which is summarized very nicely in this review that I'm citing here, uh, this region is very important for supporting inhibitory control, though it is involved in lots of other processes as well. Um, and this capacity to control behavior gets better as individuals get older. And I just want to emphasize that this doesn't mean that younger individuals can't control their behavior, but just that this is something that's harder for them to do that gets easier as they get older. And the ventral medial prefrontal cortex has been shown to reflect or store learned information about value. And in a recent meta-analysis that looked at both learned and non-learned responses uh, in the brain to reward and value over adolescence um, compared to adults, found that the ventral medial prefrontal cortex was more activated in the adolescents than the adults. And this is across a variety of studies. So meta-analysis scours the literature and compares across lots of different kinds of tasks and lots of different kinds of uh, situations. But then what is it about the interplay between value and inhibitory control uh, as these two processes develop? And in a seminal study, Somerville and colleagues showed that um, during an inhibitory control task, the inferior frontal gyrus was indirectly functionally connected with reward responding regions in the brains of adolescents. And this was not a pattern that was shown in children or in adults. So this highlights developmental differences in communication between reward and control regions in the brain. And a number of studies have now shown that for adolescents, inhibitory control is actually more challenged when they have to stop themselves from responding to cues that are repetitive or salient or rewarding in the moment that control is required. But if you think back to the coffee example, just because something is rewarding in one context doesn't mean that it always will be. So we also need to think about how value learned in one way can be flexibly used in other kinds of situations. And regarding uh, learning about value and later goal-directed use, the results have been mixed. So sometimes value learned in one context can result in uh, benefits for a later goal, whereas other times value learned uh, previously can actually disrupt your ability or your capacity to accomplish a later goal if you're an adolescent. And so it, <clears throat> it might be that different kinds of goals and how compatible or harmonious they are with the context in which value was originally learned can be important for understanding when value helps or uh, hinders future goals for adolescents. And so together, these results suggest that the kinds of goals um, that value is used for later makes a difference for uh, whether adolescents are gonna experience a greater challenge or perhaps a facilitation when compared with adults. And since <clears throat> inhibitory control capacity in adolescents is susceptible to this influence from rewards in the moment, an important open question is whether adolescents' control would also be challenged by something that was once rewarding but in the moment that control is now required, isn't actually going to be rewarding. And so in the present study, we address this question about how value learned in one context might intrude on inhibitory control later on when the thing that was once rewarding is no longer giving them rewards. And we are interested in whether this interplay is going to differ over the course of development. So to do this, we uh, tested this question using a novel paradigm in children, adolescents, and adults. And in this paradigm, there are two phases. So first, there's a conditioning phase where we build up these reward associations from scratch, and participants play this sitting in front of a computer. Uh, this is followed by a second phase uh, where we test inhibitory control for these different conditioned cues that um, participants play while we image their brain using functional MRI. And in the conditioning phase, participants learn to push a button as fast as they can in response to different shapes. So for example, this triangle or this circle. And over many trials, they learn that a fast response for the triangle will result in a reward. And a fast response to the circle will never be rewarded. But importantly, participants always have to push the button for both of these pictures. And then <clears throat> we also control the game to make sure that all participants of all ages get the same number of trials correct for each of these cues. So everyone is experiencing the same frequency of being correct and always getting the same kinds of rewards. In the second phase, participants see a bunch of new shapes that were not shown in the first game, and they have to push a button as fast as possible to all these pictures. 
But now, when they see this circle or triangle, they have to stop themselves from pressing the button. So these are the same pictures that had either always been rewarded or never been rewarded in phase one. And critically, uh, we have no rewards in this second part of the task. So we've taken these cues from conditioning and changed both the action association from making a uh, <clears throat> rapid button press to withholding a button press. And we've removed the delivery of the reward from the cue that was previously rewarded. So now we have a later goal state that conflicts with previous learning. So I'm gonna show you behavior and brain results from 127 participants between the ages of eight and 25 years old. And I'm gonna jump right to the results from the second phase from this inhibitory control task. So this cue that during conditioning uh, was never rewarded can be thought of as a baseline, and we can look at inhibitory control for a stimulus that was not influenced by previous reward. And we can compare this performance to this unrewarded cue uh, for the cue that had experienced reward during conditioning. And so we can see what the difference is between your ability to exert inhibitory control for one versus the other. And first I'll show you the difference in accuracy just for these two cues at the whole group level. And this is the ability to successfully stop yourself from pressing the button when you're instructed not to push it. So for all ages, we can see that there is a significant successful ability to do this. Everyone can do the task. But there is a reduction in this ability to withhold your button press for this previously rewarded cue when compared to the unrewarded cue. And this shows that a learned reward association is interfering with inhibitory control success. And this means that the mere history of a reward is causing individuals to push this button more when they're instructed not to. And we conduct a number of control analyses to be sure that this effect comes from the reward history as opposed to, for example, the motor conditioning that also is experienced by these stimuli, which I won't have time to show you today. Um, but feel free to come up and ask me about that later. Uh, so now having found this difference in performance between these two conditioned cues, we wanted to investigate whether there was also a difference in this by age. And so to do this, we computed a difference score for each participant between the performance for each of these cues. So if an individual follows the same pattern that we observed at the group level, they would have a negative difference score, and that means that their inhibitory control is impaired by this previous reward. And if an individual shows the opposite pattern, then they have a positive difference score, and that means that their inhibitory control would be improved by the reward history. So the y-axis here is showing this difference with lower scores reflecting an impairment and higher scores infecting, uh, reflecting an improvement. And even though we conduct our statistics using age uh, as a continuous measure, I'm just gonna bin the age groups here for ease of uh, showing you this effect. And starting with the youngest participants, we see that between eight and 15 years old, they're not really differentiating between these previously conditioned no-go cues. They're just as good at stopping themselves from pressing the button uh, for each of them. But the older participants are showing this impairment from inhibitory control from previous reward. So it seems like this disruptive effect of previous reward is emerging during adolescence and persisting into the young adults. So with the minute I have left, I wanna share um, the findings of the brain that parallel these behavioral results. Um, and to do this, I'm going to start by showing you a contrast between the previously rewarded and unrewarded cue among a set of regions that was more active for these no-go trials in general. And we found a region in the right inferior frontal gyrus, uh, which was recruited more when exercising the successful control to the previously rewarded cue, but this region didn't seem to show age associations. So to understand the parallels with age differences we saw in behavior, we conducted an analysis of functional connectivity and found that there was increased positive functional coupling between the inferior frontal gyrus and the ventral, ventral medial prefrontal cortex with increasing age. So this shows that communication between inhibitory control and value representation regions in the brain are shifting over the course of development in parallel with this increasing interference um, from reward on inhibitory control. So I showed you that when the cue was rewarding in the past but was not rewarding in the moment, this was enough to disrupt inhibitory control, but that this was not something that was unique for the adolescents. This was also something we saw in the young adults. And we saw that shifts in functional coupling between inhibitory control and value representation regions were suggestive of this sort of ongoing maturation uh, among coordination between these systems in the network. And together with previous work, this shapes our understanding of the circumstances that the developing adolescent brain might be most challenged by uh, and points to ways in which we might leverage different kinds of learning to better serve later goal demands. And I'd like to thank my uh, lab and Leah Somerville and my co-authors on this project and the TIPS organizers and you for your attention. Can you take a question? Can I have a question? Yeah. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> for the inhibitory control experiment, did you see, like, throughout the neuroimaging session, an improvement, like, in the, um, like, did, did participants get better over throughout the um, duration of the study, and, uh, like, was that at all dependent on age? Yeah, that's a great question. We uh, actually were interested in that, and I don't have the slide to show you, but um, we did see a difference. So when we look in those two groups, the older adolescent group and the young adult group, at how their impairment sort of persists across time in the task, what we see in the oldest adolescent group is that the persistence is um, sort of the intrusion effect is the same. So it stays the same from the beginning of the game to the end of the game, whereas in the young adult group, it attenuates. So by the end of the game, the older uh, adults, the sort of young adults, sorry, older adults are a different group in this context, um, the young adults actually look just like the youngest individuals in the task. They're not differentiating between the two cues anymore. So it does get better with time. Thank you. So we're gonna, we are going to uh, move right along to our final uh, symposium. Okay, so my name is Lauren DiNicola. I'm a member of the TIPS Organizing Committee, and I'm sincerely honored to introduce our final featured speaker this afternoon, Professor Nancy Canwisher. Uh, Dr. Canwisher is the Walter A. Rosenblith Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience in the Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department at MIT. She's also a founding member of the McGovern Institute for Brain Research there. Her body of work includes seminal discoveries about the human brain's functional organization. As one example, Dr. Canwisher's research identified brain regions specialized to perceive particular categories of visual stimuli, including faces. Um, and I chose this example both because it's well known and also because her articles describing these findings were some of the first neuroimaging papers I ever read, and they astounded me. Um, and Dr. Canwisher exemplifies not only um, notable scientific merit, evidenced both by her work and her accolades. She also exhibits unmatched commitment to sharing her passion for cognitive science with anyone who wants to learn. Her brain talks, which I highly recommend, cover methods, questions, findings, and are accessible to everyone. Um, I'm thrilled to hear from her today about how results from functional neuroimaging of the human brain may provide what she has termed a window into the organization of the human mind. So please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Canwisher. Thank you, Lauren. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to start by pointing out how much progress we've made in the last few decades in our field. And to see that, I think it's helpful to first step back uh, a bit to see what we knew about the or functional organization of the brain circa 1990. So here's my kind of dopey schematic diagram of the approximate state of knowledge uh, a little over 25 years ago. Uh, and what this shows is the location of primary sensory motor regions uh, that I've circled in black, uh, V1, M1, stuff like that. Those have been known for 100 years even then from studies in animals and such. Uh, and we had um, a very approximate idea of the location of basic functions like uh, language and attention and face perception from the studies of patients with focal brain damage. So that's nice, uh, but it's kind of rudimentary. Uh, and the important point I want to make is that that could have been it. That is, I remember what it was like in 1990, and it really, there was no... Um, presumption, there was no basis for assuming that there was really that much more functional organization to be discovered. It just wasn't known. Uh, and then functional MRI came along. And here's where we are today. There are now dozens of regions of the cortex in humans for which we have a pretty good idea of what they do. A pretty sp specific kind of um, description we can give of the function of that region. And what I'm showing here of the probably tens of thousands of published studies, I'm choosing ones that, okay, they're my favorites, and mostly I've been involved in and stuff like that, but, but more um, reasonably, what I'm picking out are the ones where there's just a huge effect size. I like big effects, right? And so these are all regions where the region responds you know, at least twice as much when you're doing the thing in question as when you're doing pretty much anything else. Right? And so these are also things that have been widely replicated across lots of labs. And, so, and, and what I like about this is these are regions that are present in approximately the same location in pretty much every normal person. You can pop anyone in the scanner and 
in, well, to get all of those, it might take a few sessions, maybe four hours of scanning. You can find all those regions, and they would all be there in approximately the same location. And I think that's cool, because I think this is a kind of um, a sketch of who we are cognitively. I think this is a kind of a, a diagram of the human mind, in a way, right? these separate bits. And I think that's awesome and important progress, and we should celebrate. Uh, but at the same time, um, it's the barest beginning, right? This is extremely rudimentary. And so what I want to do uh, is point out that you can think of a diagram like this as really a roadmap to future research that kind of lays bare a vast landscape of cool questions. And so I'm going to talk through a few of these, and I'll probably run out of time. So if one of you guys just gives me like the three-minute warning, I'll wrap up then. Um, but I'll start by going through... Uh, the most obvious to some kind of what I see as more current questions about these things. So one of the first things you might say is, like, really? These regions just do one thing? Uh, and lots of people don't think that, you may have noticed. Um, and uh, I'm going to argue that, yeah, a lot of them really do. I don't think all the evidence is in, but I'll show you a bit of it. But first, what I want to do is say that of the kind of pushback, I think there's been lots of counter arguments and lots of important challenges. Uh, and I think that for at least these ventral pathway visual regions like the face area, I think those have been mostly addressed, uh, except for one that I think is a really important challenge. So I'm going to discuss it today. And that is the challenge that comes from multiple voxel pattern analysis. Right? So I like to argue, here's a fusiform face area, responds like this to faces, like that to pretty much everything else. Like, hey, what the hell? Right? That's pretty clear. Uh, but then Jim Haxby comes along a while ago, and he says, hey, I can look at a pattern of response across voxels in that region, and I can tell if the person was looking at, say, cars versus shoes. And at first I said, ah, you didn't do that right. And, uh, and I don't find that when I do that. And then this went on for a while, and then, like, whoops, I did it again. It's like, yeah, I can, I can see that too. Tiny little effect. It's shrimpy. It's pathetic. But it's significant. It's real. <laughs> Uh, and then he came along and he said, well, you know, yeah, you can do it, but it's pretty weak. So we totally agree on that. You can do it. It's weak. It's there. Uh, but I think that's a really important challenge because we should care about information in the brain, not just activation. And if there's information about stuff that isn't faces in the face area, that's a, that's a substantive, important challenge. Yeah? So I take that very seriously. This is what I just said. Uh, but um, one counter to that is to say, just because we scientists can look at, say, the pattern of response across voxels in the fusiform face area and find information about cars or shoes or whatever it is, doesn't mean the rest of the brain is reading that information out there. Right? There's probably lots of information all over the brain that's epiphenomenal and that's not read out. In fact, an ideal code for faces, if you shove a car or a shoe into a system designed to code faces, you'll get different responses. Right? So the real question is, what is that region causally involved in? Not just what, can, what information can we see, but what's it causally involved in? So I had a rare opportunity a few years ago uh, to ask that question, provided by this wonderful guy over here on the left who I've never met. Um, but he was a neurosurgery patient in Japan. Um, and he's shown here, uh, this is a diagram of the bottom of his brain with electrodes all over the place that the neurosurgeons put in there before surgery to map out functions in the brain and to localize the source of his seizures. Uh, and very generously, um, this guy agreed to do our experiments. Um, and so I'm going to show you what happens with that. And just for comparison, here's the bottom of my brain uh, showing you my face selective regions in red, some color preferring regions in purple, and some place selective regions there in green. And so you can see it kind of looks like the electrodes in this guy, chosen purely for clinical reasons, landed right on top of some of the good stuff I care about. So that was pretty lucky for me. Um, and so the first thing that we did was just um, ship. Of course, we had like 24 hours notice this was happening. You get the calls. Like, do you want to collaborate? It's like, oh, OK, we're, we will get you the stimuli by tomorrow, because this is an incredible opportunity. <laughs> so my um, students and I stayed up all night and made stimuli. and. Um, sent them um, uh, a bunch of different kinds of stimuli, including pictures of bodies and faces. And because he's Japanese, we had um, uh, Tuhira and Kanji, different kinds of characters, digit strings, line drawings, objects, et cetera. And I'm going to show you the response of an electrode right in here, 
Looks like it's in roughly the position of the fusiform face area, but you never know in each individual subject till you find it. Uh, and here's the response of that electrode to these different categories of stimuli. And you can see it's damned face selective, okay? Um, and so here's an electrode right next door. In my brain, it looks like that would land on top of um, color preferring regions. And indeed, that's what you see in his brain. So the outer bars are the color version of each stimulus category, and the inner one is a grayscale version. And you can see it responds pretty broadly across stimulus categories, um, but across all of them, it likes the color version more than the grayscale version. So that's nice. It replicates with a different method what we had seen with functional MRI. It's always nice to replicate with other methods, especially methods that are much closer to you know, the actual neural responses. These are electrodes sitting right on the surface of the brain. Uh, so that's neat, but really the reason I'm talking about this uh, is that the neurosurgeons decided to electrically stimulate through those electrodes to test the, the causal role of those regions in perception. And so what I'm going to show you is a videotape of what happens when this patient is stimulated right there on top of that very face-selective electrode. And let me remind you, he's speaking Japanese, but there's subtitles. Um, and just to remind you, this guy has no idea where the electrodes are. He has no idea there's a face-selective region of cor cortex. We just show him stuff and ask him to um, say what he sees. So, um, OK, no sound as usual. I don't know why that always happens. He's looking at a face, getting stimulated there in his face here, and he says, your face just changed. Oh, there we go. He's such a perfect subject. One more time. So you can see he's getting stimulated with that little graph down there. So that shows you that you that reason is region is causally involved in face perception. Here he's looking at a box, and we're asking, is it also causally involved in the perception of other things that aren't faces? That's the crucial question to address the Haxby challenge. No change. よ、横に、なんか、目、目、口って感じで、ちょっと一瞬見えたんですけど、これ、な、何かなと思ってたら、気がついたらもう、この箱にしか見えないっていうか。うん。なんすか、よ、よ、よくまたさっきみたいに横
you might say, um, well, maybe whatever you do, whatever, maybe you hit your head hard enough, you see a face, right? We're social primates, we're primed to see faces. So what happens if you stimulate right next door in that color preferring region? Well, let's find out. So he's looking at the box again. Again, he's just told, tell us what you see. Tell us if anything changes. This is like half a centimeter away from those face electrodes. ボール見てたらもうやっぱ先が幅上げ幅広い感じ。なんかちょっと虹色に点滅してるんですけど。It's a kanji. So here you see even more amazing causal specificity right next door to the region that's selectively causally involved in face perception, stimulation of which is sufficient to produce a face percept. Right next door, in the color preferring region, stimulation of that, that region produces amazingly a rainbow. Um, so um, all that to say, and if you stimulate other places right in the vicinity, he says no change, no change, no change. And he doesn't know which one is being stimulated. So is that pattern analysis that Haxby reported and that even I find now reflective of actual causal engagement of the face region in things that aren't faces or the color region in things that aren't colors? Uh, I don't think so. Not according to these data. Right? It's not a vast amount of data. It would be nice to have more of it. But for the 40 minutes of data, and this was replicated multiple times with the same electrodes, it's about as strong as you could get. So I'm going to say, do they do just, just one thing? Some of them, yes, really, they do just one thing, apparently. Um, now, I want to be clear about what I mean by this claim of functional specificity, because I think some of the pushback comes from conflating this claim about the specificity of some regions with some other related but different ideas. So the first thing I want to say is the fact that some regions of the cortex are really extremely specific, like the ones I just showed you, doesn't at all mean that all regions of the cortex are. In fact, we know they're not. There are lots of cortical regions that are very, very general in their function. So for example, I don't know if you can see in this tiny diagram, but I've just made like a really crude bunch of ovals up there, roughly in big swaths of frontal and parietal cortex. You see kind of the opposite of all this. You see sometimes called the multiple demand network, which is more or less the same thing as the frontal parietal attention network. Regions that are engaged pretty much whenever you do anything difficult, almost anything at all. So they're extremely nonspecific. So the fact that some cortical regions are very general doesn't mean that others are very specific. The cortex is a big place, and there's lots of different stuff going on there. So the second thing I want to be clear about is that the idea of functional specificity of some regions where you find it is totally different from the question of innateness. Right? So the question of what kind of experience do you need to build that thing up, deep, important, fundamental question. I wish I knew the answer. Mostly we don't. Totally different question from how specific is that region in adults. Okay. Uh, the question of unique, uniqueness, like I think the, a, lot of mischief, a lot of mischief comes from the use of the phrase distributed activation. Because sometimes by distributed, people mean kind of Haxby-esque pattern information. But people also use it when there's two blobs, right? If there's a specific blob here and a specific blob here and they both do X, they be maybe miles apart. So they may be distributed in that sense, that they're in very different parts of the brain, but they can both be specific as hell. And the fact that there's two of them, and the fact that they're far apart, in no way undercuts their specificity. So I try to avoid distributed, because it just invites that confusion. Uh, and finally, the claim that a particular region of the cortex does some very specific thing is in no way a claim that that region acts alone. No region of the cortex acts alone. 
At the very least, a cortical region needs to get inputs so it has stuff to process, and it needs to send outputs or else there's no point in processing. Uh, and it may, for most bits of cortex, they may well need online interactions uh, throughout all their processing, right? So the claim that a region is specific is just distinct from all that. Okay, you guys knew all that, but my colleagues get confused, so I've taken to trying to unconfuse people. Okay, so that's the most obvious question. Really? I'm saying yes, really at least for many of these. A second obvious question is, okay, we have all this stuff up there. What other kind of stuff is there? So I'll just mention a few that we've been working on in my lab in recent years. Um, a few years ago, we published um, a cool paper. It's one of my favorite things we've done in a very long time, where we found that a region, oh, I probably have a pointer, so I don't need to do this lame. How do I operate this thing? Great, thank you. Um, so a region approximately right there responds very selectively when you hear music, extremely selectively. We've replicated that with intracranial recordings. It's spectacularly specific, and we think that's just ultra cool because nobody even knows why humans have music in the first place, right? So people have wondered about this. Darwin wrote about what a mystery it was. It's really clear why humans have language. It helps our survival to be able to, to share information with conspecifics, but nobody really knows why we have music. And one of the stories for a long time has been that, well, we have uh, neural machinery for language processing because it has obvious adaptive value. And then once you have that, you can co-opt it and play with it and do other stuff with it. And our data shows absolutely not. The bits that respond selectively to music respond not one iota to speech, and the bits that respond to speech respond not at all to music. And so music is not a co-option of mechanisms for speech and language. It's its own separate thing in the brain. It doesn't answer why we have it, but it rules out some of the kind of um, um, deflationary stories about why we have it. Um, in another uh, recent paper, Leila Ishik in my lab and Cami Coldwin um, showed that a region approximately back there in that kind of teal colored blob responds remarkably selectively when you look at um, videos of two agents interacting with each other compared to two agents acting independently. And that may seem weirdly specific and bizarre, but if you think about it, the vast um, literature on social perception mostly focuses on perceiving one individual and what they're doing, but lots of really important social information comes from watching pairs of people and how they interact with each other. The way you tell whether somebody's nice or not is how they treat other people, right? And so the ability to perceive those interactions and categorize them as positive or negative um, is hugely important as underlined by the beautiful developmental work from Kylie Hamlin and others showing that infants as young as three months can distinguish helping versus hindering interactions. Um, in another ongoing line of work, um, I've listed some of the papers we've published, but this is all ongoing stuff because it's early days in all these enterprises. Um, we've shown that some regions very approximately up there seem to be involved in intuitive physics. Um, and so if you think about it, every single action you take in the world, picking up a computer, walking to the door, drinking a glass of water, anything you do at all requires you to have some model of the physics of the stuff you're acting on. You need to know if I want to walk to the door, I need to know that this is a rigid object and I can't go through it. I need to go around it. If I'm going to pick up my computer, I need to know how to brace myself first, which depend, for which I need to know how heavy is the computer. Every action requires knowledge of the physics of the world. And so we've been doing a bunch of studies to try to figure out if there's systematic brain regions that are engaged in that kind of intuitive physics, which is also present very early in young infants from gorgeous work going back decades from Rene Bayarjon, Liz Spelke, and many others. And so, yeah, roughly in there. These regions, I think, are not as specific as some of the other regions, all the other regions I've been talking about. We think they do lots of other things, like planning actions. And we actually think that's pretty cool, because it makes perfect sense that evaluating the physics of the world and planning actions on it are um, things that are tightly connected. And so you might want them to cohabit the same bit of brain. Uh, so those are just a few. Uh, there are probably lots of other things. Those are the other ones that we're looking at right now. Uh, but I don't think you have a special bit of brain for every important thing you do. Um, and I'll probably run out of time and not get to this at the end. So I think actually the biggest, most fundamental open question is, one, why is this kind of organization a good kind of design for a 
computational device in the first place, and why these particular mental functions get their own patch. And I don't have an answer to that, and I think that's deeply interesting. Am I already out of time, or can I go on a bit more? Okay, you'll get, you're gonna give me the three minute warning. Okay. Uh, okay, so those are the most obvious kinds of questions that anybody can think of. Um, but moving along, really what we want to know is not just to stick a word model on a region like faces. That's kind of rudimentary. What we want to know is what computations go on in there and what representations are extracted in each region of the brain. And of course, loads of people are doing this kind of work and have been for over a decade. Uh, and I'll just mention a few of the kinds of things we're doing in my lab to try to characterize some of the representations that are present in each of these regions using either um, functional MRI adaptation or um, mul multiple voxel pattern analysis. Um, so, for example, in that um, social interaction region that responds with a univariate measure much more strongly when you see a social interaction than uh, uh, two agents acting independently, we can decode from the pattern of response in that region whether the interaction is a helping one or a hindering one, um, which I think is cool. Um, in, um, in these physics regions, ongoing work now by Sarah Schwetman, a grad student in my lab, is showing that you can decode the mass of an object from a video of that object falling, um, just heavy versus light. It's pretty basic right now, but heavy objects versus light objects. You can decode from that region what the mass is, and you can decode in a very abstract way, which is what you'd expect of a kind of physics processor in your brain, if it's really a very abstract physics processor rather than stored knowledge of very specific experiences, what we can do is we show people videos of objects falling into a, a bowl of water, and the heavy object makes a big splash, and the light object just kind of bounces on the surface. Um, and then we show the same two objects dropping on a pillow, and the action of the pillow when a heavy versus light object lands on it is quite different. And our third case, we show them uh, the heavy versus light objects, uh, which look visually identical. You have to infer the mass from the, the way it acts in the scenario. I should have said that. Um, it's sitting on a platform, and it gets blown by a hair dryer. And there, the heavy object doesn't budge, and the light object skitters across the surface. And that's good, because that means that the amount of motion energy is opposite for the heavy and light objects from the others, which is otherwise a confound and an alternative account. Uh, and so we can train on, on some of those scenarios, heavy versus light, and accurately decode on the other scenarios. And that shows that it's really a very abstract concept of mass that's represented there. Um, so that's ongoing, but uh, exciting so far. Um, and um, lots and lots of people are doing beautiful work um, showing the kinds of information that is represented in the scene selective uh, or navigation network. Uh, and I'll just mention one of my favorites from my lab, Caroline Robertson, um, did this amazing study, okay, two minutes, where she showed that you can decode from a couple of those scene selective regions, uh, the subjects remembered um, um, the appearance of the scene behind them from a front view. So they're in, an, in a 360 environment they've learned in an Oculus, and then you show them a front view, and you can decode the appearance of what's behind them uh, while they're looking at this front view, even though it's totally irrelevant to the task. And I think that means that all of us are going around right now representing what's behind us, like situation awareness, like close your eyes and think, how far back is the wall behind you? You all know that. Some part of your brain is representing it, and I think you can see that with these kinds of things. Okay, so I only got through three questions. I'll tell you the other questions. How do these things arise in development? Like the obvious question, really important, exciting. They're there early. Rebecca Sachs's data with Ben Dean show that some of them are there by six months. And there's a fascinating ongoing um, set of contradictory data on the role of experience and wiring th these things up. I think it's super exciting. We don't know the answer yet. Um, how do they evolve? We also don't know. But I think at least these ventral pathway regions, this is Rosa Lefer Souza's data, are extremely similar. In monkeys, where it goes faces, color, places, and in humans, where it goes faces, color, places. So I think those things are inherited from a common ancestor and are homologous. Um, and uh, I'll just say, I'm almost done, um, that I think an, another really obvious and absolutely fundamental question is, what is the structural connectivity of each of these regions to each other and to the rest of the brain? And even though we've had the Human Connectome Project and lots of declarations of uh, success. Um, I actually think we don't know the answer to that for any of these regions, and it drives me nuts. 
Uh, I think we do not have methods adequate to really say, what is the FFA connected to? Is it different than that adjacent color region? Tractography is lovely, but I do not think it's good enough to answer that. And whatever resting functional correlation is, it's not going to answer that either. And so I think we're at a pickle and we need a new method. Maybe one of you guys will invent that. And the final question that I already mentioned is, why is this a good organization for a brain in the first place? And I'll stop there. Questions? Uh, they're not, okay, they're not right on top of M1. I can see that. Yeah, yeah, of course, this is, this is just schematic, right? But when you look more carefully, they're like, it's, it's yeah. sort of, it's, I think it's, it's behind FEF. Um, it's like SMA, sort of. Um, and so if you do reverse inference, which usually I hate, but it's all we have right now because we haven't done those experiments, you look in the literature, what you see is, Things like action planning, tool use, that kind of stuff, those activations look a lot like what we see. And so what we're planning to do next is run those within subjects so we can ask whether it actually is the same region or just something distinct and nearby, and we don't have a good answer to that yet. You mean that there's more in the back of the head? Well, yeah, the lower yeah. Um, it's a good question. It does seem like there's less of this stuff up in the frontal lobe, but I'm also scared of the frontal lobe, so I mess around there <laughs> less. Um, I used to use a surface coil for all my imaging, not so much because it has higher SNR, which it does, but because I didn't have to say anything about frontal <laughs> activations. Um, but, um, but there's at least one counterexample, which I sort of glossed over. Um, Ev Fedorenko's work has shown, I think, extremely clearly that even, you know, sort of brocas, which is a very confused term, but the, the, the language-specific bit that's in the left frontal lobe, actually there's a couple up there, they are extremely specific for language. And so we find, if, if you do it right, if you do a group analysis and blur the hell out of your data, yes, language is on top of everything else. But if you identify those regions in each subject individually and then ask, okay, in that same subject, in those very same voxels that, you know, respond like this when you understand the meaning of a sentence and like this when you do a difficult task with a string of non-words that doesn't have meaning or syntax, um, those same regions do not respond at all during mental arithmetic, listening to music, spatial working memory, three different cognitive control tasks, like not at all. So those regions are damn specific. Um, we're, we've been looking uh, more recently at whether they're involved in some kind of abstract semantic understanding. So we have pictures that depict agent-patient relations. And you have to say which of these pictures uh, makes more sense, and it's a shark biting a man or a man biting a shark, and lots of pictures like that, right? And so I chose that because I thought, oh, agent-patient, I mean, I don't know that much about language, but agent-patient relations, isn't that kind of quintessentially who do what the who, isn't that what language is for? And, um, but th so that task, even with pictures, is the first task that we've run that does produce some activation, actually more in the, in the temporal language regions than the, than the frontal ones. Um, but uh, when we test that same task on global aphasics who have pretty much no remaining language at all, they're absolutely fine at it on pictures, not on sentences. So that's a kind of complicated story, but I think, you know, my main point is at least the language regions are very specific, except for this possible um, uh, kind of discretionary role in some aspect of high-level semantic processing in pictures, but we don't think they're, necess they, that they're necessary for... Uh, doing those tasks. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the kind of current organization and in particular your response to the popular press about right brain thinking and left brain thinking 
my response is, ugh. <laughs> um, you know, it's mostly BS, right? I mean, it's just, pfft, what's it based on, right? Look, there are differences. You know, in most people, there are more voxels in the right hemisphere than the left that respond selectively to faces. There's a left fusiform face area. It's typically smaller than the right one. There are big individual differences in that lateralization of the fusiform face area. Um, they are correlated with uh, my uh, former postdoc, Galit uh, Yovel, showed this in her own lab. I wasn't involved. I just think it's cool. She showed that the degree of lateralization of your fusiform face area, just how many voxels are face selective in right versus left fusiform gyrus, is correlated with your behavioral lateralization. That is the degree to which you collect more information from the contralateral um, side of the face. Um, so that's true, but I just don't know. I, it's not clear it's, you know, deep or informative. You know, the left fusiform face area is a little bit crappier and less selective than the, and typically smaller than the right one in most people, but, you know, so what? Um, the scene selective regions are a little bigger in the right than the left. The visual word form area is pretty much exclusively in the left in most people. Um, language regions are left lateralized. So there are, there are degrees of lateralization, but none of these have anything to do with, you know, what kind of car you want to buy. Yeah, Layla's eventually going to look at that in autism. We haven't done that yet. Um, I actually be, will be surprised if we see anything. I came in halfway through the talk on autism earlier. It looked very interesting, and I didn't, get, I didn't get enough of it to get the whole gist. I don't know where that speaker was. But anyway, my, my um, you know, distant view of that literature is that um, people with autism have not that many deficits in social perception as opposed to social cognition. I mean, I'm sure there's some, um, but they're smaller. Uh, and so everything that I've looked at, for example, you know, wouldn't you think that face selective activations would be less in, auto in people with autism than control subjects? And oh, no, they are not, right? And so many, many people have found this and either tried to publish it and not been able to or thrown up their hands and not even tried to publish it. And Rebecca Sachs is now like collecting all those papers and doing a big meta-analysis across all those studies, and there's, no, there's really no difference. The um, perception of social interactions is higher level, so maybe it's a little bit more the kind of thing that might be affected in autism. So I think it's worth a try, but it won't surprise me at all if it's not different. I wonder if you prompt the participants to kind of put themselves into the interaction? Totally. I, I think, I mean, again, I'm, you know, I'm no expert on this, but I suspect that there's a lot of room, particularly in very high-functioning <laughs> autistics, for that kind of construal. I'll tell you a funny story about this. I have a, a cousin who's a very high-functioning, smart, but definitely autistic uh, kid. And um, we showed him the Hyder and Simmel animations, which you guys have probably seen, the little shapes that are in circles that are chasing each other and socially interacting and just asked him to narrate what he saw. And he did exactly what you read about in the literature. He said, oh, the triangle is moving to the left and the circle is moving up. And he just described the physical stuff, not the social drama that's unfolding. And after he went through this for two minutes, I said, Connor, is that all you saw? And he looks at me. He's like, well, of course. It looked like a social interaction. <laughs> <laughs> so I think. <laughs> it's like, you know, it just, like, I, the, the manifestation of autism in that case was his misunderstanding the instruction I was giving to him and thinking that I was asking him for a precise description of what he saw. And so I wonder how many of those people who can't see those things misunderstood the instruction. I don't, I don't know. No, 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 no. I, when I have more time, I go through all of that. So I thought for a long time it made sense. Perception is a modular thing. You should have modules for perception. No, um, no the language stuff, which I skipped right over, but I think it's super cool. It's like these are regions that respond you know, two, three times as much when you understand the meaning of a sentence as when you do an actually much more demanding task on a string of non-words. Okay? And those regions have passed, like, you know, they, they, they do the same thing whether you read the sentence or hear the sentence. They do not respond to all these other high-level things like arithmetic and music and 
working memory and cognitive control. They're really, really specific, and that's very high level and abstract. And my favorite one is the one that Rebecca Sachs has done the most work on, and that's a region called the RTPJ uh, that responds extremely selectively when you think about what another person is thinking. And that's about as abstract and high level as you can get. And that's all done with, um, you know, you can, you can find that region whether people are reading sentences about, you know, uh, what one person is thinking about another person, uh, or whether they're watching animations that you, where you have to be thinking about that to understand what's going on uh, in, the, in the movie. So um, at least for language and understanding other minds, those are very high level and abstract and semantic and not directly perceptual. I mean, it would have been a priori a very sensible hypothesis. It was my hypothesis before we started working on language. It's like, nah, that will never be as selective as nice, respectable perceptual regions. But that turns out to be wrong. Yeah? Um, broadly, what would um, we, what would modularity have us think about the possibility of neural implants? Um, and in general, just like discussing this issue? Ooh, what kind of implants do you mean? Do you mean like um, you know electrode arrays that in, that read out signals, that read out a motor signal, or inject a perceptual representation, or what? Yeah, I think yeah, I think for now you're going to need the quarter size hole in the head and the array and everything. But yeah. yeah well, I look. I think maybe it's a little bit helpful in the sense that. Um, you know, we know roughly where different kinds of codes exist for at least these things, right? I mean, as you saw with the patient, right? But I think that implants are only going to be useful if you can get beyond the crude thing of, oh, I see a face. Like, when is that going to be useful? You need to know which face it is, right? And I think that's a much taller order, right? The neural code for a particular face or a particular facial expression or any of the other things we do with faces, um, you know, that's so, that's so, Far, uh, you know, that's so far ahead. I I can't even guess how that would go. Right? Sure. So we have our final set of flash talks. All right. Um, I want to say thank, hello, and thank you for having me. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some work that I did at the end of my PhD in um, the Drew Lab, although currently I'm up here at the Shansky Lab. Um, at the time, okay, well, we'll just click. At the time, uh, the work that I was doing revolved around adult neurogenesis, which is the birth and integration of new neurons in adulthood. It's unique to only a few regions of the brain, one of which is the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. So this is showing the hippocampus of a rodent, uh, which I guess makes me a little bit different than most of the other speakers today. Mm -hmm. um, when he, right here, I'm showing a stain that's mar uh, for one of the markers of immature neurons. You can see that this is actually a pretty sizable population, uh, which is partly what makes it so interesting to us. A number of studies have tried to look at what exactly these new neurons are contributing to memory. And they've tried to do this by just getting rid of them altogether. One way that was commonly used was focal irradiation. It's where you cover an animal with a lead shield with a single strip exposed that's right above the hippocampus. And so then the irradiation kills the dividing cells, much like it does with cancer treatment. And it's quite effective. You can see here, this is a control animal. This is, I think, probably something like seven to 10 weeks after radiation. And this is double quartin, which is another marker for immature cells. So you can see that after the control surgery, there's still a large number of cells. But then if you look at the irradiated animals, they're all gone. So it's, it's quite effective. And what these sort of studies would do is they would get rid of all these cells, and then they would test different types of hippocampus-dependent memory and see what sort of deficits they get. Uh, one type of memory that was commonly used was context fear conditioning. It's a type of Pavlovian fear conditioning in which an animal is put into a box, and they get to explore it, move around for a while, and then eventually they'll get a really, really mild foot shock. So that's going to cause them to be afraid of the context. So if you put them back into this same box 24 hours later, they're going to be afraid of it. 
you can see how behaviorally inhibited this animal is. It's making itself very small, it's freezing, it's not moving. And you can quantify the amount of time that it spends like this and use that as a measure of its fear. And this fear is specific to where it experienced the aversive event. If instead of this original box, you put it in one that's totally different, so a different shape, different amounts of light, different floor, different smell, you can see that its fear is not there. This animal was shocked the day before, but it was shocked somewhere entirely different. So it's still doing its merry thing, running around, exploring, sniffing, doing what have you. Well, these studies that irradiated the hippocampus and got rid of neurogenesis found that post-ablation, they had deficits in context fear conditioning. The animals could not learn to be afraid. And their context discrimination was also impaired. So their ability to distinguish between similar, similar contexts, similar events. And that's really awesome. But some of these methods had some limitations just inherent to what the methods were. And I think that some of those limitations left some really interesting questions. For instance, things like irradiation, that's permanent, that's long lasting, it's not reversible. So that gets rid of any sort of temporal specificity to the measure. So then I had questions like, are the adult born neurons really required for this task? Or is really what you're getting at that you're just disrupting the entire integrity of the hippocampus by just getting rid of a massive population of cells. Furthermore, when you're talking about learning, you're not just talking about just a single event. You're talking about encoding. You're talking about expressing the memory or retrieving the memory. But if you, once those cells are gone, they're gone. You're not, getting, you're not able to bring them back to have them later date. So is the activity of the adult born neurons required for different phases of context fear conditioning? And there was one other limitation as well, is most of these manipulations were systemic. So you lose the ability to look at subregions of the hippocampus. So for instance, um, you lose the ability to look at, say, the dorsal hippocampus, which I've just covered in blue dots here, versus the ventral hippocampus, which I've covered in red dots here. So again, this is the hippocampus of a rodent. It's a little bit larger relative to humans. Um, and I bring that up because the dorsal hippocampus and the ventral hippocampus have very different anatomical and functional roles. Dorsal hippocampus tends to project to more areas involved in, say, visual spatial processing, navigation, whereas the ventral hippocampus projects to a lot more kind of traditionally limbic areas, areas involved in emotion and stress regulation. And lesions to these two subregions also do very different things. Dorsal lesions tend to affect spatial memory, whereas ventral ones affect emotion and stress. So my question was is whether or not dorsal and ventral adult-born neurons differentially contribute to fear conditioning, because there is a spatial component, but there is also this emotional valence to the memory. So to address this question, I used a double transgenic mouse line, which I'm not really going to get into the specifics of it right now for time. But what I was able to do is I was able to label a small population of newborn cells with a light-sensitive proton pump. That means that when I shine a laser light on these cells, they're going to be silenced. But they're only going to be silenced for as long as they're illuminated with this light. And I will mention that all the behavioral experiments were done in awake, freely moving mice. They weren't restrained in any such any way. And so this is the general timeline for what I did. Um, I started the, ex uh, the um, labeling of the newborn cells. I waited about four weeks, and that's when we implanted them with an optic fiber. That's how we could target either the dorsal or the ventral hippocampus, and how we could get the light to these distinctive subregions. And then I ran behavior six weeks after induction. So at this point, all of my labeled cells are a maximum of six weeks old. And so the first thing I tried to do was look at whether or not they were even required for encoding a fear memory. So I trained them in context fear conditioning with the laser on, so the cells should be silenced, and I tested them 24 hours later. So initially I wanted to make sure that this didn't do something weird to their behavior, and I confirmed that this silencing did not affect their pre-shock freezing, it didn't make them inherently anxious or something. 
I also wanted to check their shock reactivity. So I looked at the distance that they traveled during the foot shock, um, and I quantified that. And I found that this did not affect the distance that they traveled during the foot shock. So I should also mention here, so dorsal wild type, these are animals that were implanted dorsally, but they're not actually getting any labeled cells, so there's nothing that should be silenced. Whereas Cree here, these animals are the animals that are implanted dorsally, but those, their cells should be silenced during acquisition. And then similarly, ventral wild type, these are animals whose cells are not silenced, but they were implanted ventrally. And then the ventral Cree animals, those are animals that were implanted targeting the ventral dentate, and their cells should be silenced. So, so far, no differences. But what about when we look 24 hours later at what this did to their memory? Well, what I found is that tar at silencing either the dorsal or the ventral adult born neurons and silencing them during acquisition negatively affected their memory 24 hours later. So this suggests that the adult born neurons are necessary for acquiring the memory. And I did rule out a number of other things. Uh, what I'm only going to show right now is that I tried taking another set of animals and I both trained and tested them with the light off, so no silencing. And the wild type animals learned similarly, so there wasn't some weird effect of light on versus off. And there wasn't just an effect of being a transgenic animal. The Cree animals froze comparably to their wild type litter mates if there was no silencing. So that's acquisition. What about expression of the memory? So I took the animals and I trained uh, some new animals. And I trained them as before, but with the laser off. And then I tested them in both that same context as well as a similar alternate context. And I did do my full counterbalancing. Uh, interest of time, I'm not showing the acquisition data. Trust me, there's no differences between any of the groups. I wasn't doing anything, so there's that. But what I found that was really interesting is that when I silenced the adult born neurons during testing, this significantly reduced their freezing in both the original and the similar context. So, so far, this is saying that both the dorsal and the ventral adult born neurons are required for the expression of the fear memory as well. So I wanted to see what, whether or not this affected the magnitude of their discrimination. It, can they still, if, if they're, it's decreasing their freezing, is it doing it comparably? Can they still tell the difference? And what I found was actually really surprising because whereas ablating all the newborn cells impairs their ability to discriminate, I found that silencing them actually improved their ability to discriminate. So I looked at a discrimination ratio. I, looked at what proportion of total freezing across both days was just to the original shock context. So in this case, if perfect memory would be a 1, a chance would be 0.5. And you can see that it's a small increase, but it's significant. And so that was surprising. So what does this tell us so far? It sounds like the dorsal and ventral adult born neurons significantly impaired acquisition and expression of fear. But surprisingly, it increased their discrimination. And I did find that the effects are specific to silencing the adult-born neurons. I managed to rule out things like genotype, how you trained them, effects of silencing, as well as estrus cycle. So what is this telling us so far? What, is, what does this mean in context? Well, this tells us that they are actually, these newborn neurons are necessary for, the, for context fear conditioning, both the acquisition of it and the expression of it. But just because they're both necessary does not necessarily mean that they're contributing in the same way. So we weren't able to confirm this, but our hypothesis so far is that the dorsal adult born neurons, the neurons in this area that's so strongly associated with spatial learning and navigation, we believe that they're contributing to the acquisition and expression of the contextual memory, the memory of the environment itself. Whereas we are hypothesizing that the ventral adult born neurons are contributing to giving the memory its valence and allowing the contextual memory to elicit fear, to elicit the emotion. So why is all this going on in the dentate of the hippocampus? Why, why don't we get this phenomenon in more brain regions? Well, I, mean, I know I don't necessarily need to tell this audience that, but bear with me. The hippocampus is necessary for episodic memory. It needs to be able to generate a unique neural representation for each new experience. So 
what we are believe what we hypothesize is that the addition of the new cells allows for new representations to be generated and that when neurogenesis is ablated the dentate is less efficient at generating new representations for new experiences it's possible then that the mice might be confusing one experience, say, with a previous one, and then that's where the contribution of the newborn neurons becomes so critical. And with that, I'd like to thank, obviously, my advisor and my lab and collaborators at the time. And Um, so they, people haven't looked at repetitive learning quite as much. It really seems to depend on the type of task that you use, since not all repetitive learning is hippocampus dependent. So more of, say, like a spatial component it has, the more it seems to be useful there. Or especially when you're distinguishing two things that are very similar, that's where it seems to be really important. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, organizers. It's been a really exciting day of a broad variety of results. I'm really honored to be here. Um, and thanks to all of you. Surprise, it's the end. You made it. Um, so um, as you and I navigate through the world, uh, we often have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty. So for instance, uh, you wake up on the day you're supposed to give a talk and you have a cold. What medicine might help you the most? Um, or more typically, which route should you take to work on any given day? Or if you're like me and you're a baseball fan, um, you might find yourself thinking about whether or where to swing to hit a pitch in baseball. Um, and in many of these situations, uh, you probably have some amount of information. So if you're a batter, you might know things about the pitcher, what they've thrown previously, the ballpark, the weather. Um, but there's still some amount of irreducible uncertainty. When you get to that moment, the pitcher releases the pitch, and you have to decide whether to swing and how to swing. There's still some amount of uncertainty. And in order to be successful, you have to make some predictions about what the likely outcome or outcomes are and take appropriate action. So if we, if we stick with this baseball metaphor, um, and you imagine you're, you're up at the plate, and here's your strike zone, and you're pretty sure you're going to get a fastball high and inside, that might show up here, or here, or here, or any of a number of locations that would result in a, in a distribution that looks like this. There's some likelihood over space. And you'll probably have a representation of that internally, some kind of subjective belief distribution or predictive distribution. And we typically describe these distributions as having a, a central tendency or a mean and a precision or a width. Um, and so let's say you're facing a, a veteran pitcher, someone who's really good. The, the distribution might look like this, and it might be kind of small and circumscribed. But you can imagine a situation in which you're facing uh, another pitcher. They're still going to throw you this fastball high and inside, but they're, they're kind of a wild pitcher. So you could have the same mean, but a different precision. And so prior work on this kind of uh, predictive inference has used explicit prediction. So asking people, where do you think this next thing is going to show up? Um, and that gets a pretty good read on this central tendency, like the most likely outcome, where do you think the next thing is going to show up? But it really misses some crucial details about the precision and the like, full richness of this internal distribution. And so that's what we're broadly interested in. Generally, how are internal predictive distributions in all of their complexity represented in the brain? How are they updated when you receive new information? And then more specifically, can we begin to answer these questions using eye movements as a readout of this internal distribution? And hopefully, over the next few minutes, I'll convince you that at least it's a promising avenue for future work. So how do we, how do we test this? We use an implicit spatial prediction task that we developed. Participants come in. We've had 56 participants come into the lab. Um, they sit in front of a computer, and we track their eye movements. And they're presented with digits on the screen uh, briefly. And their only task that they're told is to, to let us know whether these digits are even or odd. Um, 
the, uh, the digits are flanked by x's, and they're ultimately masked by a third x in the middle there. So this, this makes it more difficult, and essentially it requires you to really be looking at this location. Otherwise, you, you can't read this digit to report accurately whether it's even or odd, and then you can't earn reward. So they make a button press to say whether it's even or odd. A filled circle will appear if they were correct. An empty circle with just the white outline says that they were incorrect. Um, and then there's a, a fixed intertrial interval where nothing is on the screen for 750 milliseconds. And so you may have noticed that this is a task that from the moment you make your button press, it's really predictable in time. There's no, there's no jitter. There are not multiple values. It is, it is temporally very predictable. Um, but we can alter how predictable this is in space. And so to give you a sense of what that feels like, I have a couple of videos. It's of me doing this as a computer while I'm doing the task. So I, I urge you to play along. Um, you're certainly welcome to yell out even or odd, but at least think it to yourself. Um, so this is how this would begin. So it proceeds pretty quickly, as you can see. Hopefully, like me, you're not having too much trouble. It's these filled circles, you're getting the, the trials right. And then all of a sudden, there may be this change. I got it wrong because I didn't see where it was looking, and hopefully you had that experience also. When you're looking at it, it feels like the digit's on the screen for to like long enough. You can perceive it. You can report whether it's even or odd. But the moment you're not really looking at it, all of a sudden, you have much less information, and you have to guess. But largely, this is really predictable, aside from that change point where it jumped from like here to this new location. So we call this our no variance condition. We have these occasional change points, but pretty much it otherwise appears in the same position. In contrast, we have another type of uh, context. And again, I, I urge you to play along. So you may be getting a feel now that like this region kind of is the area that it seems to be appearing. Um, and the more trials you get, you're kind of refining this sense of where the digit's showing up. Um, but obviously, it's, it's harder. There's more noise. Um, so uh, this is our like high variance condition. There's some amount of predictability, but you're, it's, you're not able to have as precise a representation of the next location of the digit. So what does that mean for, for eye movements? Um, we have our trial structure here. It's temporally very predictable, and we can vary how spatially predictable it is. And so we have this nice inter-trial interval between our trials um, where nothing is happening on the screen, but we can, we're recording your eye movements. And so we, ha we had a couple of hypotheses. First, that at the time of digit appearance, your gaze position would reflect your central tendency of that internal distribution. So when the rubber meets the road, where, do, where are you looking? Where do you think this thing's going to appear? And then on top of that, and this, this would kind of uh, go, be in line perhaps with um, prior work with explicit prediction. Um, perhaps though, the gaze position variability during this entire interval would reflect the precision of your internal predictive distribution. So these were our, our hypotheses. What did we find? Um, so to start, here is some example data from one participant. Um, what you're seeing here is across the, uh, the x-axis, we're moving through trials. Um, we had these 40 trial blocks. You experienced this high variance condition and the no variance condition, but we had an intermediate one that was low variance and a max variance condition with no predictability whatsoever. On the y-axis is uh, the position, actually the horizontal position on the screen. And so we use this generative mean, this dashed line, um, and different amounts of noise around that mean to make things uh, more or less predictable, except in the max variance condition when it was just chosen randomly. Um, and so the actual digit locations that were selected are, are indicated in these black dots. So this should match your, your perception of things. It showed up in the same place, and then these change points, also indicated in red, happened, and then it was in a new position. Uh, so so what, is, what is the eye doing? What do the participants do? At the time of digit appearance, the eye in the no variance condition is pretty well uh, aligned on the digit location. Um, after these change points, within like one or occasionally two trials, you see the eye fully update and is now looking at this next location. And that's probably was also your subjective experience. In the low variance condition, participants are still doing pretty well. They're certainly following this general trend. And you can see, though, that um, it takes a few more trials, three, four, five trials, for them to fully update to this new location. High variance, maximum variance, much more difficult. Still, though, we're seeing some ability to uh, sort of track the global trends in the mean. 
Um, and this is data from one participant, but we see this uh, is in keeping with the rest of our 56 participant samples. So uh, this seems to reflect that yes, the, the eye position at the time of digit appearance seems to reflect the central tendency, a sense of where the most likely location of the next digit is. But what about precision? That's kind of this, this new uncharted territory. So we're looking at the variability of eye position during each intertrial interval. Here is uh, data from one example participant again, and we've separated these blocks still. So in the no variance condition, um, you have the most predictability, therefore you should have the most precise estimate of the digit location. And we saw indeed that there was the least amount of variability in your eye position. It, it was moving around the least. Now if you uh, keep ascending through variance levels, you see more and more eye position variability. And I'll just remind you that this is at a time when nothing is on the screen. There's nothing that would necessitate this being true. Um, and then this carries from not just one participant, but across the whole sample, um, such that uh, we see this in a lot of individual par uh, participants, but also uh, in black in the average uh, with the standard error. So overall, uh, this is still early, and there's a lot of uh, sort of further analyses we're doing, more data we're hoping to collect, but it seems like ocular motor behavior might be providing a readout of both the central tendency and the precision of these internal distributions. Um, I showed you this uh, evidence for this at, a, at the block level, but we also have evidence that this is happening on a trial by trial uh, scale as well. We're really excited about um, looking at other aspects of ocular motor behavior and potentially other um, features of the internal predictive distribution to see if we can derive more information from your ocular motor behavior. And ultimately, and this kind of ties into some of um, the other things that have been talked about today, but looking at domain-specific representations of uncertainty, so like for instance in the visual system itself, and how does that interact with uh, general representations in the frontal lobe, some of this predictive coding. Um, so how, how are these sort of multiple levels are we seeing this kind of uncertainty and, and uh, prediction propagate through the brain? So this has been a, a, a brief tour, happy to discuss more things one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but with that, let me do say a quick thank you to um, my advisor, Joe McGuire um, at the U, uh, my lab mates, our collaborators, our funding sources, and lastly again to you, um, speakers and audience members. Great question. Um, so we haven't looked at like sort of what happens after an error is made. We've done some looking. So there's evidence that like um, reward availability influences like saccade dynamics and things like that. In this task, we do have a reward manipulation. We're not seeing that here. It may be that sort of time course is too fast. But it would be really interesting to look also at like the effect of uh, errors on like learning rate and the um, behavior we haven't done. Yeah, it's a great idea. And let's give all of our speakers another round of applause. I think they deserve it. So, you may have noticed something about the speakers today. Um, in addition to being excellent researchers, they are also all women. In academic conferences, men inhabit substantially more speaking roles, even in disciplines with a majority of women, like certain sub-areas of psychology. The situation is improving, but we're still at a place today where often no one questions a panel or symposium that's composed of all men. Of the people who registered for this conference, 80% identified as women. Several people told us that, the, that upon seeing the advertisement with our featured speakers pictured, um, they assumed that this was a quote, women's event, even though attendance was open to everyone. And can you blame them? I bet most of you noticed, it stands out. We wanna work to normalize this image. Our organization, WIP, holds a lot of events, informational workshops, work-life balance panels, excuses to get together and eat on the department's dime, 
But in the end, we're all here for the science. The goal of TIPS is to spotlight the work of female scientists, because we know that bias can sometimes cast the work of women, as well as other underrepresented minorities, into the shadows. And who knows, maybe one day, a flyer or roster like the one for today's event might stand out a little bit less. Thank you again to all of our speakers for sharing their research with us and to all of you for attending. Haley and I would especially like to thank all the fantastic volunteers who helped us organize and set up this event. We would be delighted if you joined us for a dinner and drinks reception, which you'll find in the lounge upstairs and to your right. Thank you. The food is really good, so you really should try it. <laughs> <laughs>